Good evening and welcome to tonight's public meeting of the 2019 New York City Charter of Vision Commission. I'm Gail Benjamin, the chair of the commission, and I am joined by the following commission members. The Honorable Sal Albanese, the Honorable Dr. Lillian Barrios Paoli, the Honorable Lisette Camillo, the Honorable Jim Karras, the Honorable Steve Fiella, the Honorable Paula Gavin, the Honorable Lindsey Green, the Honorable Allison Hirsch, the Honorable Reverend Clinton Miller, the Honorable Satish Nuri, the Honorable Dr. Merrill Tisch, the Honorable Jim James Vaca, and the Honorable Carl Weisbrod. With those members present, we have a quorum. Before we begin on our business of today, I'll entertain a motion to adopt the minutes of the commission's hearing held on May 14th at the College of Staten Island, a copy of which has been provided to all of the commissioners. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second? Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? The motion carries. Over the past 11 months, this commission has engaged in a robust and comprehensive examination of our city's charter and a thoughtful deliberation of various ideas for amendments to it. As I have emphasized throughout our public meetings, as the city's foundational governing document, the charter plays a vitally important role in establishing the structures and processes of city government, which in turn affect many aspects of our everyday lives. It has been our task to evaluate how the current charter has performed since it was largely put into place in 1989 and to identify areas in which improvements could be made in order to best serve the city for the next 30 years. At our first round of borough hearings in September, as well as through engagement online and in person, we received hundreds of suggestions for changes to the charter. The Commission ultimately adopted a set of focus areas which outlined those ideas which we decided to pursue further and then held a series of expert forums at which we were able to hear from a wide array of people knowledgeable in those areas. I know that some of you here were on those panels. Following that months long process, the Commission staff issued a preliminary staff report containing its recommendations regarding those proposals which they felt particularly merited further consideration for presentation to the voters on the ballot this November. That led to another round of hearings throughout the five boroughs and engagement online where we solicited additional feedback as we worked to refine our proposals. On behalf of the entire commission, I would like to thank all of the New Yorkers who took the time to share your ideas with us, whether at hearings or online. Your ideas and feedback were immensely valuable as we undertook this important and daunting task. We sincerely hope that you felt the process allowed for meaningful and productive engagement. I know that I, for one, have done my best to keep an open mind along the way Today, it is our job to discuss, debate, and make decisions about what proposals for changes to the Charter should be placed before the voters for their consideration in a referendum this November. Commissioners, we will try to get through everything as methodically and efficiently as possible. As always, please be concise as possible and respectful of everyone's time. And to the members of the public, who have joined us today, while we know you may have very strong feelings about some of the items we'll be discussing, so that we may have an orderly meeting as possible and to allow us to get through everything on our agenda, please re refrain once more from cheering, jeering, or comments and instead indicate your agreement or disagreement using jazz hands or reverse jazz hands. <laughs> With that, let's begin. Uh, we're going to take a proposal by proposal what is on the draft sheet you have in your folder. Um, I will introduce a proposal one at a time, grouped by the proposed ballot questions, and then open the floor to commissioner discussion on that proposal. Once we have finished discussing a given proposal, including consideration of any amendments, we will vote on whether to direct the staff to prepare all necessary materials for placing that, proposed, that proposal on the ballot in November. 
Once we have gone through all the proposals, there will be an opportunity for commissioners to make motion to add any other proposals. Okay, so beginning with ranked choice voting, proposal one is to establish a ranked choice voting system for all municipal and primary, municipal primary and special elections, allow voters to rank five candidates, including write-in candidates, have this system apply beginning with the elections in 2020. Is there any discussion? Oh, I'm sorry. Do you mean 2021? I'm sorry. Yeah, not, not the elections before they would even be adopted. Is there any discussion? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we've discussed this issue at great length in this body, and election reform has been discussed at great length in just about every one of the preceding eight commissions since the 89 Charter Revision Commission. Everybody agrees that the existing system is broken and it's not serving the citizenry well. Voter apathy is at an all-time high. Civic participation continues to decline, particularly in citywide elections. And there's a general sentiment out there that this government just isn't there for the people. The consequences of that are pretty dire. It means we create this self-perpetuating cycle, right? Apathy leads to not voting, leads to less people weighing in on the essential direction of their local government, leads to less creativity and interest on the part of the government to respond to the myriad of needs in as broad a fashion as possible. So a year ago, I sat right in this seat, I think, and I had advocated along with uh, three other commissioners for a more extensive uh, set of reforms. We chose um, uh, to limit our discussions in this area and over the course of many, many sessions, I conceded that ranked choice voting is a bold and exciting move. And that's what we need. Election reform is the gateway through which every other improvement in this city or any city or state in the nation uh, is going to achieve. It's the gateway. We've got to fix it. And the time is now. What I'm curious, um, I sent uh, my colleagues a letter stating that uh, I would offer an amendment that my support of ranked choice voting was tentative and conditional. If, if it weren't to include general elections, I'm not sure that I would want to support this. So what I'd really appreciate is someone explaining to me why, what have I missed? Because I've looked at this backwards and forwards, and I can't for the life of me figure out why we would do it in one part and not another. I said this city's bipolar when it comes to its elections. We have sometimes nonpartisans, sometimes partisan. And that causes a lot of consternation among people. Now we would overhaul a system and say, in some elections it's ranked choice, and in general elections it's not. For me, maybe I'm oversimplifying this, it seems to me that what's good for the goose is good for the gander. If it's good enough in one, it's good enough in all. We shouldn't perpetuate this complex system we have where in certain times it's this and in other times it's that. So I'm asking that we consider an amendment to include, as was discussed, most of the folks that testified in my recollection said we should have it in general elections. So I'm, I'm not clear, maybe I'm missing something and I'm willing to rethink. Remember I said I listen. I genuinely listen. If I've missed something, I'll rethink this, but I don't think I have. So my amendment is include the general election as we were um, discussing throughout uh, these sessions. We have an amendment on the floor. Um, I'll, I'll second that amendment. Okay. Discussion on the amendment. Uh, Jim? 
Uh, like Steve, I've you know, tried to keep an open mind on all of these issues, and I guess it's my sort of gut feeling that if we can apply ranked choice voting to the general election as well without, and make sure there is a system for implementation that respects fusion voting and that candidates may uh, uh, run on multiple lines, I would be in favor of that. I guess where I come down slightly different from Steve is that I support ranked choice voting. I support the, uh, the proposal that's before us, but would rather see it broadened if it can be broadened. Uh, so I would leave, uh, I, I would authorize staff to uh, make sure there is a way of implementing it that respects fusion voting. And if there is to do it that way, if not, uh, to go with what's before us. And I have reached out to uh, some experts who believe that it is more a system issue uh, that can be solved. Uh, we just need to make sure that A, that's true, and that B, we have time to make sure that that can be done. Is that a friendly amendment to the amendment? No. With <laughs> <laughs> due respect. I just. You, oh, I'm sorry. Do I respond or? Yes. Oh, not to, with, with due respect. No, you get to respond to whether it's a friendly amendment. Do you accept it as a friendly amendment? No. Okay. Um, okay, so. that's my position. Okay. However that plays out. Sal? Yeah, I, I uh, want to uh, uh, support uh, the amendment of Commissioner Fiala um, and, and simply say that the rationale that's been given for this this is a very good reform, um, uh, but it's a half measure if we don't include general elections. Uh, makes no sense. I mean, we, we've got the ability uh, to address the fusion voting issue. First of all, fusion may be out the window in December uh, because of uh, a commission uh, that the mayor, that the governor has convened that will that will recommend one way or the other whether we should have fusion or not. But, you know, we have, green, we have a Green Party, we've got uh, other small parties, even the conservative party, across the ideological, ideological spectrum that's going to be adversely impacted by us, by us moving in this, in this direction, it's, it's a halfway measure. Why do we continuously do halfway things? To, to, we, want, we want the process to be open. Um, we're, we're going to confuse New Yorkers. That, that's for sure. People, won't, uh, people are going to have a hard time. Uh, being educated about this, and then we're going to tell them you can do it in the primary, in a special election. You can't do it in the general election. It makes no sense. I, I, I'm, I'm convinced that the Board of Elections, as, as, uh, as in sometimes incompetent as they are, can, can address this issue. I, I, I had a discussion with uh, the executive director about this, and, and even he acknowledged that there, there will be uh, a way to handle it uh, for, uh, for general elections. Uh, otherwise, we're going to have situations in, in the general election. You could have a situation where somebody gets elected with, with, with uh, 30, 40 percent of the vote, um, and, and it doesn't represent that district because they're not allowed to rank folks. So at the end of the day, they, they will have over 50 percent. They'll have a plurality, which represents the area. So I'm, I am vehemently opposed to just doing it for the primary and for special elections. I think we have an obligation to do it right. Thank you, Sal. Is there anyone else? Carl? Yes, I, I want to speak in favor of the proposal as written. Um, and just want to start with a, just an overall basic statement about how we're approaching all of these uh, proposals. Um, as I've said repeatedly throughout our process, I think the number one goal, first of all, let's take a step back and say I think there's a consensus generally on this commission that the 1989 Charter Commission, which revamped city government, generally speaking, got it right. And um, that our goal is not to be radical, but to refine what the 1989 Charter did, and uh, that's the way I've approached this. And second, I think another consensus issue that we've all agreed on is that we 
want to be very careful to do no harm. Um, I think to the proposal as written is a quite a dramatic step forward and to apply ranked choice voting to primaries and special elections is I think an important step, a step I favor and the vast preponderance, not all, but the vast preponderance of the testimony that we did get on this issue was in favor of ranked choice voting. But there was a considerable d split among those who favored ranked choice voting generally and those who favored ranked choice voting only for primaries and special elections. And um, I, I think that uh, uh, the organizations that testified in favor of ranked choice voting, very, very well respected organizations, largely, I think, as I recall, and certainly uh, a significant number of them at the very least, limited their recommendation to um, uh, primaries and special elections. And as Jim Karras said, I think if we see that it works in uh, primary and special elections, we always have the ability, another charter commission in the future certainly has the ability to expand it with the, with, with the safeguards that uh, Jim and others mentioned. So I, I respectfully uh, oppose the amendment but support the proposal. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Vaca? My view is that the commission has a decision to make. Do we favor ranked choice voting or not? If we go with ranked choice voting, how do we tell people that you rank choice candidates in a primary, but then in November you go back to the other system of voting for people the way you used to vote for people? I think it just, is confusing. I just think that once we make a decision on voting reform in the city, that decision has to be consistent. And I argue for consistency and a minimizing of voter confusion in the future. Um, I cannot say that we should do it in the primary and then consider what we do in the general election for another charter revision commission. No, that's not the way things should be done. Uh, we have no idea if and when this kind of next charter commission will be appointed. We don't know how many years away it could be. We don't know what action they will take. Um, I think when it comes to reform, if we do it, we have to do it correctly now. Lindsay? I, <clears throat> thanks everybody for your comments. I, I just wanted to sort of follow up. I, I generally support the concept of ranked choice voting, but I, I have a response with regards to the need for it in, in a general. You know, I generally feel like the, the, the real benefit of ranked choice voting is that it helps you get to a better way for people to sort and really choose multiple people that they like in the stages where you're really trying to, to for lack of a better term, funnel people so that you have a smaller number of candidates on which to focus in a general election. I think ranked choice voting is a better system to do that than what we have currently, but I don't think you need to take that step for the general election where by, by default, they are, you have a fewer number of people amongst which to choose. I think it's already a simple choice for voters in most instances, and I just don't think it's necessary. And I think second, there's a real value to trying this out as if it's, it's a very new idea um, for New York, we have a big voter base. It's a big systematic change to implement. I am a believer in, you know, optimistic caution. I think doing it for the places where we really need a better way for people to advance and get heard, and when you by nature have a large number of people on the ballot, it's better to start there. Sal? Well, I, you know, we, we shouldn't limit debate on this stuff. This is serious. And I just called on you, Sam, yeah, okay. please. Well, the, 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 um, one, of the, one of the ways that reforms get killed um, is let's study it further. Let's wait until the next commission. Uh, we've seen that before. I've seen the movie before. I know that uh, 
uh, Commissioner Fiala has seen the movie before. I've read the reports. You know, it's the same old story. Uh, uh, bottom line here is that every possible rationale for supporting ranch choice voting in the primary, which is a greater mandate, more choices for voters, more civility, no spoiler effect, applies to the general election as it does to the primary. The, the only difference is that you save, you save money in a runoff, which is good, and, and, and I'm all for that. But, but to limit it to just primaries and special election. Well, by the way, every other state that has ranked choice voting applies it across the board. This is insanity. I have no idea. There's no compelling reason why we should move to limit it uh, besides the idea, let's try it out. It's been tried out. We've had testimony. It's, a, it, it's, it's in effect in, in 15, 16 states. Come on, let's stop playing games. If you're opposed to it, tell us why you're opposed to it. But don't tell me to, that you want to study it further. That's nonsense. Well, I do think that uh, Commissioner Green was telling you why she was opposed to it. I don't think you can quite say she wasn't telling you that or that Carl wasn't. You may not agree with their reasons or their rationale, but they did have them. Well, I respectfully disagree, Madam Chair. Okay. Anyone else? Motion to call the question on the amendment? So moved. Second? Second. Yes? Um, point of clarification, we're calling the question on the amendment, not the original question. Correct. This is on the amendment. Commissioner Albanese? Four. Commissioner Berrios Paoli? What was that? No. No. Commissioner Camillo? Commissioner Karras? Yes. Commissioner Fiala? Yes. Commissioner Gavin? No. Thank God it's still a yes. I know it in the mic. Commissioner Green? No. I'd like to, t if everyone could make sure that when they speak, they're directly speaking into the mic so it gets picked up for the transcript, that would be appreciated. Commissioner Hirsch? No. Commissioner Miller? In favor of the amendment. Commissioner Norrie? Yes. Commissioner Tisch? No. Commissioner Vaca? Yes. Commissioner Weisbrod? No. Six votes in the affirmative, seven in the negative. Uh, I'm sorry, Chair Benjamin? No. Six votes in the affirmative, eight votes in the negative. The motion fails. Okay, moving back to the original question then. Is there other discussion? Does anyone want to call the question on the proposal one? I, I, I move that proposal one as uh, presented be adopted. Second? Second. Roll call. Commissioner Albanese? Uh, uh, pass. Commissioner Berrios Paley? Yes. Commissioner Camillo? Yes. Commissioner Karras? Yes. Commissioner Fiala? If I could explain my vote. Um, yes. I am use. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I've sat in this body a number of times, cast thousands of votes. I'm very used to being in the minority and being <laughs> voted down. Uh, so I appreciate, Jim, I appreciate you very much. <laughs> um, the urgent need for reform in this area is so paramount that I'd rather give the people half a loaf than nothing at all, so I vote aye. Commissioner Gavin? Yes. Commissioner Green? Yes. Commissioner Hirsch? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Nori? Yes. Commissioner Tisch? No. I'd like to explain. Yes, you may. From the time I was um, 
About five or six years old, one of the greatest things that happened to me was my grandmother, who was an immigrant, who could not speak a word of English, took me to vote with her um, on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And let me just tell you, it was the Lower East Side before the millennials discovered, reinvented, and improved on the Lower East Side. But I, the power to vote and the ability to get people who are running and seeking office to tell you exactly what they think, to me, is one of the greatest privileges of our democracy. And I took the opportunity, I never do this, to write down um, exactly what I wanted to say. This is an experiment that, unfortunately, I can support. Our American system of democracy is, at its best, has always been predicated upon people casting their vote for the candidate they believe will do the best job. In turn, that forces candidates to seek to persuade voters to make a singular and sometimes really difficult choice. Ranked voting is a well-intentioned experiment that could reap at best uncertain and perhaps complicated consequences. For example, if we enacted such a system, it could well give candidates an incentive not to take clear issue positions, preferring to play to the audience for being everyone's second choice by offending as few people as possible to rack up second and third choice votes. Therefore, I think that we should take some time, study this with great care. A city that is headed towards nine million in population by the middle of this century should trust Hamilton and Madison over Rube Goldberg in structuring its democracy. I applaud experimentation in every aspect of our democracy. I understand that our system is at best flawed, but I just think this is something that given the complications of our election, our ability to count votes, our ability to get our electorate out to come out and vote, we're just not ready for it. Thank you very much, Commissioner Tisch. Commissioner Vaca? Aye. Commissioner Weisbrod? Uh, aye. Commissioner Albanese? Aye. Chair Benjamin? Aye. The motion carries. Okay, proposal number two is on the timing of special elections. Uh, this would extend the time period between when a special election is announced and when it is held from 45 days to 60 days for a mayoral special election to 80 to 90 days in order to provide sufficient time to accommodate state and federal laws relating to military voting and early voting. Discussion? Call the question. Second? Second. Roll call. Commissioner Albanese? Yes. Commissioner Berrios Pelli? Yes. Commissioner Camillo? Yes. Commissioner Karras? Yes. Commissioner Fiala? Aye. Commissioner Gavin? Yes. Commissioner Green? Yes. Commissioner Hirsch? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Norrie? Yes. Commissioner Tisch? Yes. Commissioner Vaca? Yes. Commissioner Weisbrod? Yes. Chair Benjamin? Yes. Motion carries. Proposal three, timing of redistricting. Amend the timeline for establishing council district boundaries in order to ensure that such boundaries are established with sufficient time before the petitioning period established under the recent state law, which allows early voting. 
have such changes apply to the next occurring redistricting and to each redistricting thereafter. Do not alter the officials, entities responsible for appointing the members of the districting commission. Discussion? No discussion. Call the question. I call the question. Second? Second. Roll call. Commissioner Albanese? Uh, yes. Commissioner Berrios Paoli? Yes. Commissioner Camillo? Yes. Commissioner Karras? Yes. Commissioner Fiala? Commissioner Gavin? Yes. Commissioner Green? Yes. Commissioner Hirsch? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Norrie? Yes. Commissioner Tisch? Yes. Commissioner Vaca? Yes. Commissioner Weisbrod? Yes. Chair Benjamin? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. And I would just like to ask if people on the dais or in the audience could turn their cell phones to airplane mode or silence, I would appreciate it. Um, the next ballot grouping is about the Civilian Complaint Review Board. Proposal number four, structure of the Civilian Complaint Review Board. The board is currently comprised of 13 members. All of the members are ultimately appointed by the mayor, but five are designated by the council, one from each borough, and three are designated by the police commissioner with, with each having law enforcement experience. Is it? This proposal would change the structure so that the board would be expanded to 15 members, adding two new members. One of the new members would be appointed by the public advocate. The other new member would serve as chair and would be jointly appointed by the mayor and the speaker, provided that a process be established for appointment of an interim chair if the mayor and speaker cannot agree on a chair in a timely fashion. The council would appoint its members directly rather than designating them. Is there discussion? Yes, I have a question. Um, I'm told we're going to go back to proposal three on redistricting. Um, and as a member from the prevailing side, I would ask for reconsideration of proposal three. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The item is before us again for reconsideration. Commissioner Vaca. Um, I'm sorry, Commissioner Albanese. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, um, on the issue of redistricting, um, we've had testimony around this issue uh, by experts um, and, and others. Uh, who expressed an opinion about redistricting, which is too often a very political process um, that I believe uh, we should follow other states and municipality and reform it. And my amendment calls for a independent redistricting commission that would be, that would emulate California, uh, Arizona, uh, Alaska or another, 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 and a couple other states where the people that are selected are obviously people of integrity, but they're not lobbyists, they're not connected to the political system. In, in one state, we, they do it by lottery. So my, my amendment calls for establishing an independent commission for, to draw the lines of council district, such as a commission whose members are selected by lottery. That's, that's my amendment. Discussion? Lindsay? Uh, thank you, Sal. <clears throat> Could you elaborate on, on how such a lottery might work? Is it, is it just randomly selected from 
the general public, like jury duty, or from a specific subset of people? It's in, in California, it's done by uh, the general public, uh, voters, registered voters, uh, and they're interviewed, they're screened, um, and, and uh, they're, they're, that's the way they, they elect, uh, th that's where they appoint uh, those folks, and they draw the district lines. Are the lines drawn any better? Um, I am concerned. I know that there have been issues in California about the redistricting lines and about whether they, how they are drawn and which populations they favor. So my question would be, does this system result in the drawing of lines that are more equitable? It, 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 I believe it has uh, in, in, the, in the states that have been, uh, have, have implemented it. There, there seems to be, there was a little bit of a controversy in California, but in other places it, it hasn't caused any problems. I mean, basically what the, the, the objective is to uh, distance itself from politics as much as you can so that we don't have gerrymandered districts, uh, so we don't have districts that are catering to particular politicians, um, and, and I, I believe that's important, I, and I, that's why uh, I offered the amendment. I, I, I've, I've been through, as a council member, uh, a number of re redistricting uh, periods, and I've seen, I've seen the games that are played by folks that are appointed by by politicians. I mean, they, they, they eliminate uh, housing blocks that are favorable to one politician and, and included in another, in another district that favors somebody else based on the political persuasion or the, uh, or the alliance with the power structure. Um, I think redistricting is too important to be left to uh, folks that are uh, uh, linked to the political establishment. It should be done in a way that's as independent as possible. Uh, and, and I'm open to other suggestions besides a lottery um, uh, th that uh, we, we can look at, uh, but I, I do believe we should move to an independent commission. Is there anyone else who wants to speak? Sorry? No, I said, is there anyone else who wants to speak on the amendment? Call the question. Are we voting on the amendment? Yes, we're voting on the amendment. If somebody would second calling the question. Second. <laughs> Commissioner Albanese? Uh, yes. Commissioner Berrios Paoli? No. Commissioner Camillo? No. Commissioner Karras? No. Commissioner Fiala? I'd like to explain my vote. Um, Commissioner Albanese, I, I applaud you for addressing the issue. Um, conceptually, I agree that we need to uh, look at this. This is a movement, I think, that is part of the national dialogue. Uh, my only concern is that given uh, the time that we've had to discuss it, um, I, I, I would have concerns about how it would be constructed at this, um, this particular time. But conceptually, I'm with you, but I'm going to vote no on the amendment. Commissioner Gavin? No. Commissioner Green? No. Commissioner Hirsch? No. Commissioner Miller? No. Commissioner Norrie? No. Commissioner Tisch? No. Commissioner Vaca? No. Commissioner Weisbrod? No. Chair Benjamin? I'd also like to explain my vote very quickly. I would like to be associated with remarks of Council Member Fiella. As I indicated when I spoke, I do think that redistricting is an important issue and how we do it, not just here, but all over the country, not just looking at the political parties, but at populations, and how we achieve <coughs> districts that are 
equitable and fair is an important issue, and I don't think we've had enough time to really examine the ways in which we might examine the, the issue of redistricting and then proceed to find solutions that might work. So for that reason, I cannot support this amendment at this time, but I'd be happy to work with you in the future on something. Thank you. Motion fails. Um, can we, by unanimous consent, revote proposal three? Yes. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Proposal three is readopted. Moving back to proposal four, which was on the CCRB. Is there anyone who wishes to be heard? Lisette? I just had a, a clarification question. So I know that the, the language provides that uh, to give, a, to provided that a process shall be established. Um, that's the language in, in the proposal as drafted. Who, who would come up with the process? Or is that part of further study? Um, Who would come up with the process for the? Appointment of an interim chair. Um, I can imagine there would be several ways, but I believe that staff is intending to come back with a proposal as part of the drafting process that we could all look at. So for when we vote on the question, the question will provide the actual process? Yes. Great, thank you. Any further discussion? Call the question. Call the question. Second. Second. Um, discuss. We discussed. Uh, call the roll, please. Commissioner Albanese. Uh, pass. Commissioner Barrios Paley. Yes. Commissioner Camillo. Yes. Commissioner Karras. Yes. Commissioner Fiala? No, pending a reconsideration upon a, a, you know, further clarification on the refinement of the, um, the mechanisms that were just discussed. I'm not clear. For the interim appointment, the interim. if one is so, needed? So we will, we will be revisiting this, obviously, um, because there is going to be a caveat here, right? So um, on this round, I vote no. Commissioner Gavin? Yes. Commissioner Green? Yes. Commissioner Hirsch? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Madam Chair, uh, just a brief commentary before mm -hmm. my vote. Although this is progress uh, from the present makeup of the CCRB, I don't, I don't think it goes far enough. Um, we'd be naive to think that complainants, civilians who have complaints against the misconduct of the police would get a fair hearing when the overwhelming majority of appointments come through the mayor and the police commissioner. So um, I'm betwixt and between. It's, it's good to see progress, but if there's any area in this city where there's distrust, it lies in the, the relationship between citizens and the police. So I'll have to vote no. Commissioner Nori? Yes. Commissioner Tisch? Abstain. Commissioner Vaca? Yes. Commissioner Weisbrod? Yes. Chair Benjamin? Yes. Commissioner Albanese? Yes. Eleven in the affirmative, two negative, one abstention. The motion carries. Proposal number five also has to do with CCRB and deviation from disciplinary recommendations and would require that the police commissioner provide CCRB with an explanation in all cases where the police commissioner intends to depart from discipline recommended by the CCRB or by the New York City deputy, department deputy or assistant deputy commissioner for trials. Discussion? Chair Benjamin. Yes. I just wanted to uh, endorse this strongly, uh, given the uh, testimonies we've heard. 
I do believe it is very, very critical that we all know, and I mean all, know reasons for deviation from the discipline recommendations. So I would like to just give a strong endorsement to this. Any other discussion? Call the question. Call the question. Second. Um. Call the roll. Commissioner Albanese? Uh, pass. Commissioner Berrios Paoli? Yes. Commissioner Camillo? Yes. Commissioner Karras? Yes. Commissioner Fiala? I'd like to explain my vote. This was a recommendation advanced in the White Report. Um, it's been deemed essential. I think the police commissioner or the, uh, the NYPD testified as well that um, they want to see this process move forward and that the Blue Ribbon Panel uh, proposal uh, is, a, is a sound one, so I vote aye. Commissioner Gavin? Yes. Commissioner Green? Yes. Commissioner Hirsch? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Nori? Yes. Commissioner Tisch? Abstain. Commissioner Vaca? Yes. Commissioner Weisbrod? Yes. Commissioner Albanese? Yes. Chair Benjamin? Yes. Motion carries. Proposal number six is the de delegation of subpoena power. It would allow CCRB through a majority vote of the board to delegate its subpoena power to and withdraw its subpoena power from the CCRB executive director um, who, when he was here, spoke about the problems that arise from the board having to vote on, on the subpoenas and that evidence of different types, particularly um, from cameras, was overwritten and other things that would prevent it from being useful, which is the reason for that discussion. Call the question and second. Call the question. Second. Call the roll. Commissioner Albanese? Yes. Commissioner Berrios Paoli? Yes. Commissioner Camillo? Yes. Commissioner Karras? Yes. Commissioner Fiala? Explain. Yes. I think um, now I had a problem with this when I first saw it, and it's not because it's CCRB related. It's the very nature of the delegation of authority away from the officials. Um, and uh, I think it's ill-advised, but uh, it seems to me that a compelling case was made by all of the advocates. Um, so in light of the testimony that was given and the, what appears to be a pressing need to get this because of the camera issue, I'm willing to go against my own better judgment and say aye. Commissioner Gavin? Yes. Commissioner Green? Yes. Commissioner Hirsch? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Nori? Yes. Commissioner Tisch? Abstain. Commissioner Vaca? Yes. Commissioner Weisbrod? Yes. Chair Benjamin? Yes. Motion carries. Proposal seven is false official statements in CCRB matters. Allows CCRB to investigate and recommend discipline against an officer who is the subject of a CCRB complaint if that officer makes a false material statement within the course of CCRB's investigation or prosecution of such complaint. Discussion. Oh, sorry, Allison. Um, yes, thank you. I um, would like to propose an amendment to this um, proposal. I think. Uh, I agree with the proposal as it stands, but I think it actually doesn't go far enough. I think that the CCRB's current inability to investigate all conduct, uh, misconduct or potential misconduct related to a fatal complaint 
uh, unnecessarily ties their hands. When you think about a case such as Daniel Pantaleo, let's say in the Eric Garner case, the fact that the CCRB is only allowed to investigate and try on the chokehold itself and not the related misconduct that occurred in that situation, such as the false arrest, the failure, potential failure to provide aid, witness intimidation, leaking in addition to the false statements. And I think that um, given the lack of trust that exists right now between the community and the police department, leaving those um, additional items of misconduct to the IAB to handle internally does not feel like a, the step forward that we need in police community relations. And so I would like to amend um, this proposal to allow the CCRB to investigate all misconduct associated or uh, alleged misconduct associated with the FATO complaint, not simply false statements. Discussion? Question on the, um, I have a question. Jim? Would that include officers other than the subject of the investigation? I'm, I'm trying to figure out how much broader you're going with, with your amendment. Um, that is a good question. Um, I think that, um, that I, I, let me, can I get back to you on that? I actually hadn't thought through the other officers. I mean, I think, I guess I would say that I believe it should include all officers who were on site and participating in said complaint. But doesn't CCRB need a complainant as to that officer? So I'm not sure you could expand so, to include officers right. who were not in front of CCRB or for which a complaint had not been made. That's, that's fair. We, I mean, I need to look at it in a little bit more detail, but I think keeping it within the constructs of whatever CCRB is it, investigating, so I guess the fatal complaint is against a singular officer, so it would be just that officer. Okay, thanks. Sorry for the confusion. So, uh, is she withdrawing her amendment or? I don't believe so. I think she's just leaving it as originally. It's on the official if you could speak into the mic. Sorry, I, um, so I'm leaving it as it originally stands, so it would be against uh, additional misconduct by the, complain the complainant. I'm, I'm, st I'm still not clear. No. Lisette? I just had a, a, a question regarding, I guess, jurisdiction. Um, all of these issues all, any, all of these misconducts, whether it be making a false material statement or any and other that you anticipate, currently those types of issues are uh, under the jurisdiction of IAB. Is that correct? That is my understanding, yes. Yes. Thank you. Sal, do we have, um, did you get an answer to your question? Sort of, I'm still, uh, I'm still not uh, clear. Can I, can I ask, what is, what is the amendment? Excuse me? What is the amendment? The Madam, amendment? Madam what is the amendment? Allison? Sorry, I was not withdrawing my amendment. So no, we weren't right. suggesting okay. you were. Just, Carl could, was, could yes. The amendment, the amendment is, again, is to allow the CCRB to investigate all misconduct associated with a FATO complaint. Um, so a complaint that is already within CCRB's jurisdiction, not only false statements. So I would, maybe not only false statements would not be in the actual language of the amendment. Good. But M Madam Chair, Ma if I Ma can... This. Could we have a hypothetical there? I mean, I think I gave a hypothetical in my remarks, which is the uh, Eric Garner case, where I think there is a, a lot of evidence is probably not the technical term, because I'm not a lawyer, but there is um, 
there were a lot of areas, allegations, thank you, my attorney sitting next to me, a lot of allegations of additional misconduct besides, in addition to the chokehold itself that um, Officer Pantaleo engaged in. And it's, since the CCRB is running an investigation or was running an investigation against Officer Pantaleo, they should be able to investigate all of the allegations, not simply the act of the chokehold itself. Can I? Yes. But Allison, I just want to make clear, all of the allegations against Officer Pantaleo. Yes. Okay, it's not against some other officer who there's Cor no complaint against who may be appearing in that CCTV Correct. case. Okay, thanks. Further discussion? Are we ready to call the question? I'm not, did, uh, okay. Call the question. Second. Roll call. Is it the <coughs> amendment? Calling the question on the amendment. On, the on amendment. Commissioner Hirsch's amendment. On the amendment only. Commissioner Albanese. Uh, no. Commissioner Berrios Paoli. Yes. Commissioner Camilo. No. Commissioner Karras. Yes. Commissioner Fiala. No. Commissioner Gavin. No. Commissioner Green. No. Commissioner Hirsch. Yes. Commissioner Miller. In favor of the amendment. Commissioner Nori. Yes. Commissioner Tisch. Abstain. Commissioner Vaca. No. Commissioner Weisbrod. No. Chair Benjamin. No. Five in the affirmative, eight in the negative, one abstention, motion fails. Is there more discussion on proposal seven as stands? I'd just like to point out that, you know, with, without the amendment, this is, an this is a very narrow and I think really necessary component. Uh, as city employees, I mean, we are always held to a high standard, but I think, you know, in today's day and age when we see what's going on in Washington, to think that somebody can appear before an oversight board and about a complaint against them and lie to that board and that board has to just sit there and listen and can do nothing about it, it that would blow my mind that I think we don't expect Congress to do nothing when they are faced with people, you know, lying to them. I, I don't think we should hold anyone to a different standard. Anyone else? Call the question. Uh, point of information. Yes. Uh, how is that handled presently by the police department? Do we know? By the CCRB, we, by I, internal affairs, how is that handled? It's a very, if the complaint is at CCRB, it is my understanding that CCRB is free to file a finding of, what's it called? A finding of alleged credibil uh, uh, credibility finding, adverse, adverse credibility with, the, with IAD. And then IAB handles it. Yes, that was the subject um, in part of a report by um, Mary Jo White that concluded that in almost 90% of the cases, no discipline resulted in, uh, from, I, IA, from those that were forwarded to IAD. Did they recommend, did the report recommend that it be handled by the CCRB? 
I don't believe the report made a recommendation. I'm told that the record. Yeah, yeah, that was outside. It was outside the scope of their report recommendations. Are there any further? Did that address your concern? Yeah, okay. I just want to get more feedback. Um, seeing no further questions, call the question. Second. Second. Roll call. Commissioner Albanese. Uh, pass. Commissioner Berrios Paoli. Yes. Commissioner Camillo. No. Commissioner Karras. Yes. Commissioner Fiala. No. Commissioner Gavin. No. Commissioner Green. No. Commissioner Hirsch. Yes. Commissioner Miller. Is abstinence allowed or, or pass? It's, it's the same thing. Well, if you abstain, you are not voting, but it counts in the negative. Okay. So you can abstain. I'll abstain. Thank you. Commissioner Norrie. Yes. Commissioner Tisch. Abstain. Commissioner Vaca. No. Commissioner Weisbrod. No. Chair Benjamin. I'm sorry, Commissioner Albanese. No. Chair Benjamin. Yes. Five in the affirmative, seven in the negative, two abstentions. The motion fails. Proposal number eight is a guaranteed budget for CCRB. Require that the CCRB personnel budget be no less than 0.3% of the personnel budget for the New York City Police Department. In fiscal year 2019, this would have resulted in a CCRB personnel budget of $15.2 million instead of $12.8 million. Discussion. Lindsay? Uh, yes, I, I, I know I've sent some comments to, to staff on, on this effect, and I fully support the need for CCRB to have a guaranteed budget. I think there's probably a slightly cleaner way to approach it. Um, I, um, is now the right time to propose an amendment or just? Yeah, if you want to oh, offer that. Um, I'll, I'll sort of explain, and then I'll, I'll propose the amendment. I think a, there's a lot of stuff that's in personnel budgets that's not necessarily tied to the core work of the, the police department in terms of the officers on the street and, and doing the work. And I think that is the place where CCRB's investigative work is focused. So I think it's, it's a cleaner w place to tie a ratio, um, <clears throat> to tie the CCRB budget to a ratio of uh, CCRB personnel people to the number of officers rather than a sort of dollar for dollar budget ratio. So the amendment I'm proposing is require that the CCRB <coughs> budget be to be sufficient to fund personnel uh, service expenses for a number of employees that is equal to 0.5% of the number of uniformed PD personnel um, with the caveat um, that unless the mayor makes a written determination of fiscal necessity. Um, is there a discussion, Jim? I, I have a question. Uh, uh, just a clarification, sorry, it was the proposed ratio is actually 0.54, um, uh, not simply 0.5. What would that work out to in terms of dollars for their budget today as if, if this were passed as opposed to what they have now? I believe it is uh, an, uh, an increase. I don't have the exact figures. I can, I can try to do that math and follow up. I would appreciate it. I'm worried that the 0.3% uh, that it comes out to about a little over $2 million that with the camera 
you know, uh, the, the, the uh, video that they need to go through and stuff may not be enough. So I'm, I'm wondering, you know, I want to make sure we get them to a, a good place. I, I think it's, it's um, it would be about the current level, but it, and not, not so much of a substantial increase, but it provides for a substantial increase as the number of officers changes. I think there's a lot of other things in the budget besides some of the camera stuff that you talk about. Um, and the dollar budget, it sort of can fluctuate based on the seniority and the tenure of the people that are within the police department, both officers and more traditional civilian folks. And I, that just, that to me is a lot of instability compared to a personnel ratio. Um, when you say that uh, unless the mayor makes a written determination of fiscal necessity, what does that mean? That is, um, if, if there are exceptions to the ratio, it's usually uh, in an event of basically fiscal emergency, um, but, and that's usually deployed across the board, not necessarily specific to um, some sets. It's, it's a general type of caveat that exists in a lot of the budget process. Would you be willing to have language that said that it was the determination would have to be of a general fiscal emergency or something. One of the concerns that I had certainly when reading that language is that a mayor could say there's an emergency here and I'm going to take the money from CCRB and so that's a fiscal necessity mm. even though other agencies are getting increases and I think that the point of this was the mayor has certain things in the first part of the sentence. There's a relationship between the number of officers and the personnel, and if the number of officers goes down, their budget goes down. Um, so if we're talking about a situation where the number of officers stays the same or goes up, but their budget is gonna go down anyway, I think it has to be more than just a letter of a, I'm taking money away from you, but there has to be some plan to eliminate the gap or something of that nature. Is that something you would consider as a friendly amendment? Uh, I think uh, that's, I, I appreciate that concern. I think my, I, I would propose not to amend the language in that way because this is language that's consistent in, in some other places and how we do the budgeting process now and generally speaking this you know even if we you'd, you'd make a proposal to change the budget because the personnel number changed it still goes into the broader bucket to have the budget approved and, and negotiated with between the mayor and the city council so i think there's some check on that sort of robbing from you know place a to, to sort of go to place b in that regard without trying to change this this fundamental concept of fiscal necessity Okay. Can I just say, Madam Chair, uh, Commissioner Green, you, you, when, when you say no to a friendly amendment, you did it much more delicately than I did. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Any further discussion? Call the question. On the, this is on the amendment offered by Commissioner Green. Um, that would require that the CCRB budget be sufficient to fund personnel service expenses for a number of employees that is equal to 0.54% of the number of uniformed NYD, NYPD personnel unless the mayor makes a written determination of fiscal necessity. Call the question, call the roll. Commissioner Albanese? Uh, pass. Commissioner Berrios Paoli? No. Commissioner Camillo? Yes. Commissioner Karras? No. Commissioner Fiala? No. Commissioner Gavin? Yes. Commissioner Green? Yes. Commissioner Hirsch? No. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Nori? No. Commissioner Tisch? Abstain. Commissioner Vaca? No.
Commissioner Weisbrod? Yes. Commissioner Albanese? No. Chair Benjamin? No. Five in the affirmative, eight in the negative, one abstention. The motion fails. Are there other? Yes. Jim? I may. <laughs> uh, I'd like to require that, the, uh, in terms of the 0.3%, uh, the CCRB, which is the only, you know, that to my knowledge, the only mayoral controlled agency that appeared before us and actually made a case that their budget was insufficient uh, and asked for 1%. Uh, now, I know that 1% is, is quite a large increase, but I would like to make an amendment to require that the personnel budget be at least a fixed percentage of the personnel budget for NYPD, but not yet specify that percentage, other than that it should be no less than 0.3% and no greater than 0.5%, and ask the staff uh, you know, to do some more work with the CCRB and with the numbers and with the costs associated with going through these films and these, these uh, body cameras and come back with uh, a number to us in the final, uh, in the final report. Discussion? Call the question. Second? There was a second over here. It was quiet, but it was. Got it. <laughs> Commissioner Albanese? A uh, pass. Commissioner Berrios Paoli? No. Commissioner Camillo? No. Commissioner Karras? Yes. Commissioner Fiala? No, with the right to reverse upon, similar to the first item in this batch, uh, I want to reserve the right to reverse this vote uh, pending the staff's um, uh, determination. Commissioner Gavin? No. Commissioner Green? No. Commissioner Hirsch? No. Commissioner Nori? Yes. Commissioner Tisch? Abstain. Commissioner Vaca? I can explain briefly. Um, I believe that for the CCRB to fulfill its mission, it has to have resources. And as my colleague indicated, they were one of the few agencies that came to this Charter Revision Commission saying that they had insufficient resources. Based on that, if we're going to be addressing CCRB, CCRB issues in the Charter, I want to be supportive. So I will vote yes. Commissioner Weisbrod? No. Commissioner Albanese? Uh, no. Chair Benjamin? Yes. Four in the affirmative, eight in the negative, one abstention, motion fails. Okay, so we're back to Proposal 8 as written. Is there any further discussion on Proposal 8 as written? If not, call the question. Is there a second? Okay. Please call the roll. Commissioner Albanese? Pass. Commissioner Berrios Paoli? Yes. Commissioner Camillo? No. Commissioner Karras? Yes. Commissioner Fiala? No. Commissioner Gavin? No. Commissioner Green? No, with the explanation that I support having a guaranteed budget. I just don't like this particular formula. Commissioner Hirsch? Yes. Commissioner Nori? Yes. Commissioner Tisch? Abstain. Commissioner Vaca? I 
do not think that these numbers are numbers that I can be supportive of. I did express, though, that we should be looking at more money for the CCRB, so I will vote no at this time. Commissioner Weisbrod? Um, no, but I'd like to explain my vote because this is going to come up um, uh, uh, in subsequent discussions regarding uh, fixed and guaranteed budgets, which is that um, I, I generally support the notion of um, here, the CCRB, having a fixed budget, but I also believe that there has to be some sort of fail-safe for the mayor in a time of fiscal uh, constraint to um, not necessarily be in a hundred percent formulaic um, uh, situation. And I appreciate the concern that many have raised that the proposed amendments um, uh, as written, uh, proposed amendments are loose in terms of what, how the mayor um, makes a determination of fiscal necessity and under uh, what uh, straitjackets uh, he or she might be able to do that. Um, uh, and we are familiar with instances in the past where uh, mayors have um, cut budgets of uh, other elected officials or departments based on um, on their uh, uh, momentary spats with, with those departments. Um, but nevertheless, I think that there has to be a way for mayors to exercise that kind of fiscal constraint in, uh, in, in, in periods of true economic uh, uh, crisis and restraint. And so I, I would ask the staff I, to, to ponder this issue more generally. I'm going to vote no here, but I do think that there should be a way to refine this language in a way that uh, protects against what all of us fear, while at the same time um, assuring uh, that the goals that these amendments um, have can be realized. That was a no vote, I take it? Yes, I said no at the outset. Oh, I didn't. Commissioner Albanese? A yes. Chair Benjamin? Yes. Um, would you read the roll, please? The vote is six in the affirmative, six in the negative, with one abstention. Motion fails. 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 Um, I believe this is an important issue, and I sense that others would also agree that it's an important issue, but that we haven't come to a way that we can all feel comfortable. So I would propose that we reconsider. Jim? Jim. Oh, I'm sorry, Steve. It's okay. Thank you. That we reconsider one of the amendments so that we can direct staff in a particular way if, but I would add the caveat that the, the language about fiscal necessity needs to be changed. So I, I would second your call for a reconsideration with the understanding. I want to associate my comments 
uh, with Commissioner Weisbrod. I have those same concerns. There has to be some kind of a mechanism in place. If we start creating uh, but guaranteed budgets with no recourse, eventually elected officials are responsible for everything and nothing at the same time. So if, if, if there is a way to, with the, the actual original proposal, to insert into that proposal that fail-safe mechanism that Commissioner Weisbrod speaks about, I, I would certainly then, Madam Chair, follow your lead because I do, I do agree, I, 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 this is important, but what I Carl said is, is, is potentially, uh, it's got a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of negative potential, so we want to be careful about the unintended consequences of doing something right. Madam Chair? Yes, Jimmy? I would also be willing to um, reassess my vote if we get the wording correct here. Um, I want the CCRB to be adequately funded. We had them come here and tell us that they're not. I just think that we need wording, but I do agree that the staff recommendation is the starting point that I can be supportive of if we can nail down a little further. Is there anyone else who, Alice? Um, I would also reconsider my vote on the um, amendment that Commissioner Green proposed, proposed with a, um, more clarity around what the determination of fiscal necessity means. So I would concur. Okay, we have two proposals on the floor then. Um, I thought that's what I heard you suggest. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> would, would you mind just repeating what the two standing proposals that are on the floor are? The two standing proposals, as I have heard them, are one that we reconsider the amendment that the CCRB budget be sufficient to fund, um, and while changing the, unless the mayor makes a written determination of fiscal necessity, um, to something that also gives the CCRB some reliable sense that it can't be, their budget can't be cut whimsically or retaliatory or any of that. So I'm not sure what the language is. So, but but um, I believe that the proposal that Commissioner Green put on the floor essentially changes the way it's calculated because it's tied to the number of uniformed officers as opposed to personnel in general. That is correct. Oh, okay. There is a second proposal on the floor though that we take proposal eight as is and add in this financial fail safe in the event of, of okay. Right, sorry, my misunderstanding. So you go with that. With, with, yeah, with, 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 the second with, one. So then, we, so then we got four following, including you, right? So, yes, there's a reconsideration following your lead. Yes. Um, is there more discussion on that? I mean, I, <clears throat> I, I guess I just I, I wanted to reiterate. I I feel like a like a finance or a spreadsheet nerd, but um, which I will own I am, but the, the, the ratio purely based on personnel budgets, I just think it's, it's vague. Um, it, and we're talking about a, a floor, it's not that you can't go above um, if you deem it, deem it necessary, and in many instances there, there are, but I still think a personnel to personnel, like body to body ratio, is still a more meritorious approach. Jim? I would be willing as well to support proposal eight uh, with a determination of fiscal necessity that had some definition to it that were, was broader than, you know, and essentially any fiscal reason. Uh, but not uh, 
the number that Commissioner Green is suggesting that would essentially leave their budget the same, but subject to potential increases. So are you proposing to amend the amendment? Uh, I thought you said proposal eight with a... Yes. Deter but yes, but I thought what you were saying just now was that you wanted to include the between point three and point no, no, I mean, I... I, I'm just trying to get it. I right. would prefer that, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But I think that amendment went down. So. Oh. Read the whole. Can you read the whole? Oh, I'm sorry. So Could I you guess please read the whole new proposed yeah. okay. recommendation? Proposal number eight require that the CCRB personnel budget be no less than 0.3% of the personnel budget for the New York City Police Department unless the mayor, I don't know the language for this, but unless the mayor essentially makes a general determination of fiscal necess necessity or makes a, does anybody have language? <clears throat> Madam that, Chair. Carl? Can, can I make a suggestion because I think when 15 or however many of us are here, 13 of us are trying to draft something, it is doomed to failure. And <laughs> may, may I, but you know, the lawyers, the lawyers, we have lawyers. We have all of them. And, and when many of us are lawyers, it's even more doomed to failure. But, <laughs> but, but can, can, I think there's a general consensus that we do want to have a fixed budget for the CCRB and that we don't want the CCRB's budget to get unfixed in a, as a result of a retaliatory spat from either the police department or the mayor or whatever. And what it seems to me rather than trying to refine that right now, it, if we could defer, since we know where we want to go with this, could, if we could defer this to um, June 18th and get language from the staff that we could uh, uh, potentially all agree on, I think that would be a much better outcome than trying to fashion that language here among Well, just in case we're able to finish all of our work today, would you be agreeable to staff in sending out the proposal that results from this that they send out before that proposed language for eight to be included. And then we could all have this conversation by email, phone, and other technological. From your lips to God's ears, Madam Chair, that we finished tonight. <laughs> um, but it, uh, I, I think what we're, what I'm suggesting is that at least with respect to this matter, matter where we know where we want to go, that we, instead of resolving, refining it tonight, uh, we defer it to the staff grappling with this and hopefully having heard all of this conversation coming back to us either technologically or in person. In person and um, uh, hopefully with an approach that we can all agree on. Uh, so I would, go ahead. Madam Chair, I, I, I agree with uh, Commissioner Weisbrot, but I, I do believe we need to do that in person. I don't think, I don't think it's a good idea because it's an important issue to, to delve into it, uh, you know, through emails. Who knows what's gonna happen with that? That can go on and on and on. So I think we, we need to, as you pointed out, this is a crucial issue. Uh, I think we should come back and, and uh, review it on the 18th. I, I concur. Excuse me? Yes? There are a number of other proposals in this package that will bump up against the same set of language requirements. So as we come to them, uh, can we just be reminded that we've already had the conversation on the language requirements? Absolutely. Oh. Absolutely. So on proposal number eight, as we've been discussing, directing staff to 
add to proposal number eight language that would allow the mayor in the case of fiscal necessity for the city uh, to amend the budget clearly in a downward direction um, that staff will come back to us with language that would accomplish that. Um, is there any further discussion? Yeah, uh, Madam Chair, just a, a big one. I think there's also a murkiness around, you know, as, as Mr. Karras indicated and as um, Ms. Green indicated, a murkiness around what the what the formula is as well. So I, I would just ask that the staff look at both of those issues here. The, were you saying the number as well, Carl? I'm sorry? The number as well? No. I, I can't <laughs> hear you. I think, you I think it's whether you calculate it through the whole staff or you calculate it through just a uniform person. Right. Oh, and if I could add to that, that the staff look at the number as well. Not, and again, we have not, Unfortunately, we did not vote to expand the jurisdiction of the CCRB, so I realize that that number is probably not going to be significantly different. But if staff feels that it should be a somewhat higher number, I, I would like to know that at that time as well. Okay, so let me see if I can fashion a sense of where we are now so that we can vote on it. Um, oh, that's true. Okay, so what we're going to do now. Chair Benjamin, might I suggest that we vote on sending it back? We just voted it down, so right. so if I we think could we vote on sending to vote it back. To bring it back. We've reconsidered it. Did we, did we vote on the reconsideration? No, so it's not with us at all. So what I would propose we do is that we vote to reconsider proposal eight. Then we set it aside with a direction to staff to come back to us uh, and, and fashion it more closely in the following ways. I second that. Okay. Just question. Uh, and a, a, a yes vote for reconsideration is to do just that. Send yes. Uh, call the roll on the reconsideration with a direction to staff that would include a fiscal necessity portion that would, number two, include a analysis of the personnel versus uniform personnel issue and recommendation, and would also include a fiscal analysis of whether 0.3% is adequate. Yes. Everybody happy? Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> Can you call the roll on that, please? Commissioner Albanese? Yes. Commissioner Barrios Paoli? Yes. Commissioner Camillo? Yes. Commissioner Karras? Yes. Commissioner Fiala? Yes. Commissioner Gavin? Yes. Commissioner Green? Yes. Commissioner Hirsch? Yes. Commissioner Nori? Yes. Commissioner Tisch? Abstain. Commissioner Vaca? Commissioner Weisbrod? Yes. Chair Benjamin? Yes. Motion carries. Great. Um, now we're on to the governance. Proposal nine, appointment of corporation council. This proposal would provide for the city's corporation council to be appointed by the mayor with the advice and consent of the council. Any discussion? Mr. Karras. I'm not asking for a fixed term of one year or two years or three years or four years. Uh, so, you know, I came on strong on this issue. I feel that this, if we can support this, that this is a good move to make for the best interests of the city, uh, as the law department likes to say. Uh, so I ask you all to please support this. Thank you. Anyone else? Jimmy. I, I also want to rise in, in support of this. The uh, Corporation Council of our city is important, uh, not just to the mayor. It's important to community boards who our city, who 
are agencies in their own right. They give guidance to um, agencies, elected officials. The Corporation Council rises to that level. So I want to be supportive of that as well. Sal? I'd like to uh, associate my uh, comments. i like to associate with the comments of uh, Commissioner Vaca. I, I think that the Corporation Council has to have a bit of bit more objectivity. Uh, he's not only the He's not just a mayor's lawyer. Uh, he's uh, uh, the attorney for all of uh, the folks that work uh, for the city and the different branches of government. Um, so I, I, th I think this is a, uh, a, a positive step. Are there other people who have discussion issues? Then let's call the question. Is there a second? Let's call the roll. Commissioner Albanese? Yes. Commissioner Berrios Paoli? Yes. Commissioner Camillo? Uh, move to explain my vote very quickly. I, because there's no term limit <laughs> uh, portion to this proposal, I can support. You can support. So yes. Commissioner Karras? Yes. Commissioner Fiala? Explain. Um, we have wrestled with this since 89. And uh, the two commissions that I were on and the other six all have heard this, this subject matter ad nauseum. Um, I am, uh, I was disinclined at the start of the process. Um, I, my hope was that a robust memorandum of understanding between the two parts of this hall would have settled this. I've been here, and I want Jim Karras to know uh, you've twisted my arm. Um, notwithstanding my concerns, I understand that 30 years is too long to wait, and that this position, unlike several other positions that have been discussed with advice and consent, is extremely unique. This is the lawyer for the, go the government of the city of New York. There are two sides to this hall. And every mayor and every council since David Dinkins forward has had this tension. Uh, it's time we end the tension. And I think this is uh, a fairly modest way in the big scheme of things of putting this to bed. I vote aye. Commissioner Gavin. I vote yes, and I'd also like to comment that I think this is a fair solution, especially without term limits. So yes. Commissioner Green? Yes. Commissioner Hirsch? Yes. Commissioner Nori? Yes. Commissioner Tisch? Yes. Commissioner Vaca? Yes. Commissioner Weisbrod? Yes, and I, I'd also like to explain my vote. I just really want to commend um, Mr. Karras, who very persuasive magnum opus, um, <laughs> um, really did turn me around on this issue, where I, like many people uh, here, uh, as I've said, originally uh, had reservations about this. Um, uh, but I really appreciate the work that Jim Karras did on it, and I uh, join my colleagues in voting aye. Chair Benjamin? Aye. Motion carries. Proposal 10 is on the Conflict of Interest Board, COIB, COIB structure. COIB currently consists of five members appointed by the mayor with the advice and consent of the council. This proposal would change the structure of COIB to replace two of the mayoral appointees with one appointee by the controller and one appointee by the public advocate. Discussion? I'd like to make an amendment to change the structure of the COIB so that it is composed of three members appointed by the public advocate, one member by the mayor, and one member appointed by the controller. Uh, I do this because um, the conflict of interest boards hears cases, and I would estimate that 95% of the cases they hear are against city employees that work for 
the executive branch. The overwhelming number of cases that COID hears are against people who work for the executive branch, who work for the mayor or his agencies or his commissioners. I don't speak about this mayor. I speak about the institution of the mayoralty. It does not make sense, but more than that, it's not appropriate to have a conflict of interest board where the mayor has the, the majority of the votes. This conflict of interest board, if you believe in good government at all, if anything has to be independent, it has to be the conflict of interest board. If anything has to be above reproach where people have total faith and confidence, it has to be the conflict of interest board. I don't have to tell you, you can go back and read newspapers from the last 10 to 15 years, and you can see cases where the judgment or the lack of action from the Conflict of Interest Board has been questioned by editorial boards, good government groups, and many others. Now, the configuration I propose would give the public advocate a majority of the members as opposed to the mayor. Um, this commission started out where many of us were discussing giving the public advocate some formal powers. We basically have not. Uh, our report that's recommended gives him a member of this commission, a member of that commission, and life goes on. But I do think that if we're looking for something where the public advocate can play a role, it is on COIB. It is when it comes to ethics. I would still give the mayor one appointment. And as I said, this is not about the current mayor or former mayors. This is institutional. Um, if we go forth with a COIB that is continually controlled by the executive, many people will question actions they take or inaction that they could be accused of. So I would ask my colleagues to look at that amendment and I would urge its adoption. Thank you, Jimmy. Any further discussion? Uh, I, I want, to, want to agree with uh, Commissioner Vacco. I think the Conflict and Interest Board is it's essential that we even avoid the appearance of impropriety. Um, and, and what we're here to do is forget about the the individuals that are in office, but how do we create a mechanism that minimizes conflicts of interest? And we have seen already um, a number of uh, uh, a number of decisions by the COIB that that there were questionable. There were new stories about potential conflicts. Uh, um, the, the, the law firms that those folks came from um, were, were close to the mayor. And, and once again, it's not about this mayor. It's an institutional issue. And I think one of our fundamental missions is to minimize conflicts of interest, have checks and balances. And uh, um, I think uh, COIB is one of, uh, one of the agencies that has to be above re reproach. And, and the way it's structured, Presently, it's not, so I think that uh, Commissioner Vacca, while he wants the public advocate to, to do more, which is great, uh, uh, that, that it, beyond that, it's, it, it, it does create, uh, it, it's about checks and balances, and I, I think this is a well, um, a wise amendment that I think we should support. Allison? So I want to respectfully speak in opposition to this amendment. I think that um, the conflict of interest board should be outside of politics, and by putting a majority of members on that board, um, having the majority of members on that board being appointed by an elected official who is by definition in our charter at odds with the members of the mayoral administration that is the role of the public advocate and is the proper role for the public advocate. But I would not want the public advocate to have over, uh, complete oversight and authority over the administrative responsibilities of identifying legitimate conflicts of interest and figuring out how to most effectively govern understanding that conflicts of interest are only natural and human and they have to be adjudicated properly. And so I think that this amendment has the opposite impact of what um, 
Commissioner Albanese said, and actually overly politicizes the office of the Conflict of Interest Board, and I find that to be very concerning. Uh, Satish? Just a quick point of clarification. Under this amendment, what happens to the advice and consent for the three members that are not appointed by the mayor? You have to speak I would the keep mic. that in place. Can I answer, uh, uh, Commissioner Hirsch, or? Um, when you, when you want. Give me one second. I, I think Paula? that, I'm yes, sorry. Thank you. Um, I too am opposed to this amendment because I do believe that the recommendation imposes checks and balances. Um, with three and two, I do feel we're entering into a good checks and balances with the current recommendation, so I too oppose the amendment. Jimmy, and then since, since the main objection appears to be that I've given the public advocate um, three of the five appointments, I would be willing to modify my amendment to give the public advocate only two, to give one to the controller, one to the speaker of the council, and one to the mayor. Are you amending your I'm amendment? I'm amending my amendment because the main objection I seem to hear is that the public advocate has three appointments. So I would recommend that we give the public advocate two, the controller one, one to the speaker of the council, and one to the mayor. No, I, uh, May I Allison? reply to that? I, I appreciate the effort, Commissioner Vaca. Um, I guess l let me rephrase my concern of this amendment. I think the Conflict of Interest Board should be an administrative agency that handles um, potential conflicts of interest and adjudicates them in a not in an as unpolitical of a way as possible. I'm sure there is a more eloquent way to say that. I do not think that it should be a gotcha body. It is a body that staff and leaders of the city need to go to to ask advice on how best to do their job in the most ethical way possible. And if that becomes politicized and people who have interests that are um, potentially um, better served by the failure of an administration, mayoral administration, than the success of a mayoral administration, the Conflicts of Interest Board becomes an incredibly powerful tool to use against that said administration, and I think that it could be very dangerous for the functioning of the city. I think it is very dangerous to leave the Conflict of Interest Board under the control of one politician. The mayor of the city of New York is a politician, just like it was alleged Others are politicians. They're all politicians. I'm proposing that no one have control of the Conflict of Interest Board because of the fairness that we should be expecting from them. I'm sure that there are people who will oppose any change on this. I think it's wrong. I think it's, it's terrible to think that we should have the current system in place and have it continue. I know that if I, I could change this board to five Supreme Court judges and there'd still be a resistance to, to giving up mayoral control. I could put Ruth Bader Ginsburg on this and there would still be people saying leave it as it is. Thank you. Carl? Um, I, I just want to associate myself with what uh, Allison said. I, I think that this is, uh, she is exactly right, this is an administrative body and it's uh, and not a gotcha body. And I think the proposal 10 before us with the uh, uh, added caveat that, um, that Satish clarified, which is that the additional appointees, the controller's uh, appointee and the public advocate's appointee, uh, also be subject to the advice and consent of the council, creates exactly the right, the right balance between um, the executive branch of government, the legislative branch of government, and the uh, elected officials who um, are, are in charge of both our uh, uh, financial matters uh, and, uh, and the public advocate. Just as, long as we know, just as long as we know what we're saying, those who've said it, conflict of interest board should be a mayoral agency just like the parks department and just like the police department. If that's good, if that's good government, then I, 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 I question the judgment and the political wisdom of those who feel that way. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, is there any way, uh, there are some good points raised uh, uh, about uh, uh, the 
public advocate appointing three members, and, and uh, while I support, I j in, in principle support what Commissioner Vack is saying, is there a possibility that we could rework this so that we, we, can, we can have a body that is not controlled by one entity, but, but certainly balanced across the board? Um, maybe the staff can come up with uh, some suggestions or proposal here that, that, would, that would allow for that. Uh, right now, this proposal that, that the staff recommended still places the conflict and interest board under the domination of the mayor. And, and uh, that doesn't help anything. I mean, I, I think that th that should be, an, the CIB should be an independent, but it should almost be like the independent budget office. It's a very sensitive body, it's a judicial body, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be dominated by one politician. Um, of course, you know, I, I, I understand some of the opposition, a lot of it is unfortunately political, but, but we should be doing the right thing here. I think we need to vote on the amendment first, as we did the last one, and then based on that vote, see where we can go. Vote on the amendment that, yes. as written? As, well, as Mr. Vaca said and modified by Mr. Vaca, and Mr. Vaca, do you accept the modification of Satish Nuri that added the subject to the advice and that all of those appointees, two from the public advocate, one from the controller, one from the speaker, and one from the mayor would be subject to the advice and consent of the council? I do accept the amendment. So, the amendment that is on the floor now, which has been further amended, would now say to change the structure of COIB so that it is composed of five members, two appointed by the public advocate, one member appointed by the controller, one member appointed by the speaker of the city council, and one member appointed by the mayor, all subject to the advice and consent of the council. That is the motion that Mr. Vaca has further amended to. Call the question. I'll second that. Excuse me? You want to second yeah. that motion? Let's call the roll on the amendment. Commissioner Albanese? Yes. Commissioner Berrios Paoli? Yes. Commissioner Camillo? No. Commissioner Karras? Uh, I'm torn. I see merits on both sides. Uh, I, I was ready to oppose because I thought we shouldn't give it to the control to the public advocate. But at the same time, I also see the merit in what Carl says that two members plus advice and consent over the mayor's office is somewhat balanced. I'm gonna vote no, but I'm not sure I will stay a no uh, with what comes later. Commissioner Fiala? Yes. Commissioner Gavin? No. Commissioner Hirsch? No. Commissioner Nori? Yes. Commissioner Tisch? No. Commissioner Vaca? Yes. Commissioner Weisbrod? No. Chair Benjamin? At this time, I'm going to have to vote no because I do believe that the mayor having one appointment doesn't work for me. I believe that as the executive of the city and the person who would carry out in its own way the discipline, the mayor needs to have appointments on the board who understand both the possibilities of that discipline and where the mayor would fall. So at this time, I have to vote no. Uh, five votes in the affirmative, seven votes in the negative. The motion fails. Yes. Madam Chair? Yes. Um, I, I would like to uh, propose a 
modest amendment to Proposal 10, which um, simply uh, adds the clarification that uh, Commissioner Nori first um, made a, a while ago, that the change uh, uh, to replace two of the mayoral appointees with one controller appointee and one public advocate appointee also be subject to the advice and consent of the council. And with that, propose that we move proposal number 10. Can we add? Uh, and uh, Madam Chair, I, I don't know the order of things. This is, that would be your determination. But we, in order to ease the concerns of the appointment of the mayor, the four members appointed by the mayor, and your concerns, Madam Chair, I will be willing to have two appointees by the mayor. Okay, hold on to that thought. We have an amendment right now on the floor, which is to amend proposal 10 to add that the controller appointee and public advocate appointee would be subject to the advice and consent of the council. Can we do that by unanimous consent? Yes. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Fine, so that's amended. Now we have a further amendment Yes, um, uh, I from would, Commissioner Vaca. I would amend to have two members appointed by the mayor, one from the public advocate, one from the controller, and one from the speaker of the council, all subject to confirmation. I hope that this eases the concerns of the chair and the four members appointed by the mayor. Discussion? Just uh, yeah. Is there any discussion? I, I just w would like oh, to I say that, yeah, the Commissioner Vaca has been uh, has been flexible. He's been willing to uh, listen to other people's viewpoints and, and has uh, agreed to some amendments, which I think are are reasonable, but still uh, make the Conflict and Interest Board um, uh, an independent entity that's not not clouded by, by politics, at least to the extent that it is now. So I, I think it's a, it's a very good and sound proposal. I would hope that the mayor's representatives would support it. Would there be any qualifications, Jimmy, for the persons who are appointed by the speaker? Yeah, do they have to be a lawyer? Could it be a council member? Um. I would be open to having whatever qualifications we now have for the Conflict of Interest Board appoint, um, be um, mandated upon all the appointing officers. I would be open to having all, whatever qualifications are set forth must be met by the appointees of the mayor, public advocate, controller, and speaker. But, don't, uh, Madam Chair, don't we have those uh, qualifications already in place? Uh, it, it states you can't be a lobbyist, you can't be running for office, uh, you can't be a crook, uh, <laughs> just kidding. You can be a crook, you just can't be a felon. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm not a, do, do the guidelines say that if you're on the COIB, you cannot be a lobbyist? Or is there a, a, It does say that, yeah. Uh, you cannot be a lobbyist at, at that time that you're appointed, but you can be a lobbyist in the past. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, you, so we, we, we could have lobbyists now on the COIB. I don't know. So m my point is that I would be open to all guidelines and, and mandates being applied across the board to all the appointing offices. Yes, Madam Chair. Can I make a further suggestion that would ease my comfort level? Um, that instead of the speaker rep, we have Corporation Council as the fifth person? I cannot accept that, Madam Chair. The Corporation Council is an appointee of the mayor. With the advice and consent of the council? I cannot accept that, no. Okay. Any further discussion? 
Call the questions. Could you repeat what was <laughs> lost? Okay, the question, the amendment before us is to change the structure of COIB to replace the mayoral appointees with two mayoral appointees, one appointee of the public advocate, one appointee of the controller, and one appointment of the speaker. Um, all subject to the advice and consent of the council. Thank you. Call the question. Call the question. Second. Second. Call the roll, please. Commissioner Albanese? Yes. Commissioner Berrios Paoli? Yes. Commissioner Camillo? No. Commissioner Karras? Uh, Jimmy, you probably sweetened the pot just enough to make me tip over the other way. Um, I will vote yes, but also with the caveat that if this carries, I'm going to think about this between now and the final report. Commissioner Fayala? Yes. Commissioner Gavin? No. Commissioner Green? No. Commissioner Hirsch? No. Commissioner Nori? Yes. Commissioner Tisch? I'm not a mayoral appointee, but I still vote no. Hmm. Commissioner Vaca? Yes. Commissioner Weisbrod? No. Chair Benjamin? I know you're trying, Jimmy, but I'm still not comfortable. If it passes, I'll try and find a way to make myself more comfortable, but I'm just not there. Vote is six in the affirmative, second, seven in the negative. Motion fails. So Madam Chair. Yes. Now, now I would like to move proposal 10 as written and as amended by unanimous consent. Second. Call the roll. Commissioner Albanese. I'd just like to explain my vote. I, 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 uh, uh, I will vote yes with the, with the uh, caveat that I believe uh, this is a s slightly better than the present uh, constitution of the uh, Conflict and Interest Board. The structure is a little better, but I still think it's, uh, uh, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, doesn't achieve the independence, the, um, the appearance of impropriety that we need for this board. Uh, but since it's a slight improvement, I'll, I'll vote yes. Commissioner Berrios Paoli? Yes. Commissioner Camillo? Yes. Commissioner Karras? Uh, I'm going to just, I think it's more than a slight improvement, Val. Uh, you know, I, I was convinced uh, by Jimmy, but I think two non-mayoral reps with advice and consent and all the reps is, is a real improvement. It still, as Jimmy says, has control with the mayor, but uh, I vote yes. I think it's, it's a good proposal. Commissioner Fiala. Explain. I, too, want to commend uh, Council Member Vaca. You have been pushing this for years. We just went through five amendments. Um, uh, you're going to get the prize at the end of this. I'm going to associate my remarks with Commissioner Albanese and Karras. This is an improvement, albeit very small, over what we have. And if that's the choice before us, it's a yes. Commissioner Gavin? I am voting yes, and I do think it's a significant improvement. Thank you. Commissioner Green? Yes. Commissioner Hirsch? Yes. Commissioner Nori? Yes. Commissioner Tisch? Yes. Commissioner Vaca? Yes. <laughs> now that's what I call a really talented statesman. <laughs> Commissioner Weisbrod? Yes. Chair Benjamin? Yes. Motion carries. Proposal 11, 
is the MWBE citywide director in office require that the citywide director of the minority and women-owned business enterprise, the MWBE program, re report directly to the mayor and require further that such director be supported by a mayoral office of MWBEs. Discussion? Call the question. Call the roll. A second, would somebody second? Second, 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 <laughs> second, second. Commissioner Albanese? Yes. Commissioner Berrios Paoli? Yes. Commissioner Camillo? Yes. Commissioner Karras? Yes. Commissioner Fiala? No. Commissioner Gavin? Yes. Commissioner Green? Yes. Commissioner Hirsch? Um, I'd like to explain my vote. Um, I'm going to vote yes, but I also do want to be clear that enshrining an office of minority and women-owned businesses in the city's charter is really only a small step forward that does not match the scale of the problem that we are facing. While we must support every effort to improve diversity in our city, by merely enshrining an existing initiative into law, the office of MWBEs is ultimately a little bit disappointing in terms of what we could have accomplished on this commission. Over the last few months, we've been debating the merits of what kind of city charter revisions would bring our city into the 21st century and set us on a course for a brighter, more equitable future. And that's exactly why we really need a chief diversity officer in City Hall and CDOs in every agency. We need someone at the very top to be that compliance and equity watchdog and tackle the pervasive patterns of discrimination that extend throughout city government. It's why we need an office with oversight and enforcement over not just MWBEs, but broadly across our city to ensure that city's employees and budget reflect the breadth of diversity in our city. These positions have teeth. They are armed with data and power to make change. By conducting internal audits and assessments, a CDO would reveal discrimination patterns in workforce and procurement and work closely with the mayor and agency commissioners to implement effective programs with transparency, metrics, goals, and accountability. Other cities across the country have a chief diversity officer. New York should not be at the back of that pack. So while I'm voting yes for the Charter's proposed Office of Minority and Women-Owned Businesses, I um, and continue to be disappointed that we not, could not take this proposal farther. Thanks. Commissioner Nori? Yes. Commissioner Tisch? Yes, and I'd like to commend Allison on her eloquent explication of a very critical issue. Commissioner Vaca? Yes. Commissioner Weisbrod? Yes. Chair Benjamin? Yes. Motion carries. This is not the proposal for the diversity officer? No. Is, all right, my mistake here. Is this related to the local law that was passed establishing a citywide director? The what I'm trying to get at is, uh, forgive my, uh, it's my fault, my confusion, I'm looking here at my notes. This particular position, is this a position that it, exists or is this a, a new citywide diversity officer that has been proposed? This is not a new citywide diversity officer. Does this, this relate to previous legislation passed creating this position? Yes? 2013. In 2013. Okay. It is not the legislation that you are thinking about that was adopted by the council earlier this year and that was to be implemented by, I believe, May 1st. It is not that. I, I owe you all an apology. I'm pulling my notes and I... So this relates to a local law that was established five or six years ago. Okay. So consistent with what... I'd like to change my vote, but I want to explain why. Consistent with what I said at the beginning of this process. It's good to try things legislatively, <laughs> run it, see how it goes, and then when there's enough consensus that something works, and if it is of such substantial import, you then import it into the charter. My apologies for my confusion. So I, I'd like to be uh, uh, noted as Change I. your vote. Please. Okay. 
So if you would read the vote, the revised vote, vote count. The revised vote total is 13 in the affirmative, zero in the negative. Okay. Moving on to ballot grouping number four, which is finance. Proposal 12 has to do with units of appropriation and would establish a mechanism through which the council and the mayor can jointly establish a structure for units of appropriation outside of the confines of the budget season. Um, what this would mean, and there was a lot of discussion about this, and I think we all owe Jim in particular a debt of gratitude. Um, there was a lot of discussion about the fact that while the charter requires meaningful units of appropriation, some of the units of appropriation have been so large as to make the ability to monitor them and the programs with which they are associated somewhat impossible. It is also true that a number of city agencies have moved in discussions with the council to have to split their units of appropriation so that people can more closely understand what is being proposed. Um, in one of our last hearings, um, Commissioner Fiella had suggested that the way this should best be handled is for the mayor and the council to find a way to come together and discuss this and arrive at reasonable units of appropriation. And that is what this proposal would do. It would require the establishing of that mechanism. Um, so I just wanted to explain why we are there as opposed to anywhere else. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, is there discussion? Would you mind just expanding a little bit more? You said that this, in your interpretation, this proposal speaks directly to your proposal. What I had suggested they do, and that's to talk, right? To negotiate through the normal political process, uh, and, and and we feel that the the need the the need ex the need. And I I want to. Jim Karras deserves a standing ovation. 30 new units of appropriation this year. You know, we, I haven't seen that in the last 30 years. Um, so again, Jim, kudos. I'm just concerned that we're going to import into the charter a direction that two parties in the same building that do this routine, routinely have to talk. I mean, what, what, do, what do we hope to yield from this? I think what we hope to that, that hasn't been achieved since we've already seen success recently, and I'll be and, and without your advocacy, it would not have happened. So and I, that, I believe that without this commission considering this issue, it would not have happened in the way that it did, um, and that we want to continue to reward the great behavior of the agency heads who have, in fact, worked really hard to come up with realistic units of appropriation and to, once we are gone, to continue that effort. What I, what I envision, and that's really just me, is that there might be, and the staff would come back to us with this, there might be a schedule, let's say, that in year one, three agencies, four agencies come forward with their proposal and that in year two, three more agencies come forward. I do not envision that it would say that on September 1st, the mayor and the council sit down and work this through. So a, a kind of binding resolution between the parties, but what happens if it doesn't happen? What happens if, you know, in year two, Previously, we had agreed to six new units of appropriation for agency A, B, and C. W w w walk me through this. Well, fortunately or unfortunately, there are no budget police, um, other than OMB, I guess, but they're not exactly the police. Um, I 
I'm not sure I have a good answer for that at this stage, but I would like to see if we could go further to try and come up, that we could let this go further to try and come up with one and see if there's a process that we can all agree to and feel comfortable that the sides would in fact have incentives to do so. Forced conversation. Yes. That isn't taking, that hasn't taken place, not now. It hasn't taken place sufficiently over 30 years. I'm, I'm just so leery because what, <laughs> you're gonna hear a proposal, you have a proposal from me later on for borough presidents that is essentially the same thing. It is forcing conversation and it kills me to have to ask that we put in the charter language that tells people you should talk to that side and you should talk to that side. And at the end of the day, what, what, what recourse is there? What happens when it doesn't? So in other words, it's a Hail Mary pass to an extent. To an extent, no, although. No, um, if, the, if the dialogue doesn't happen, nothing yeah. happens. Yeah. OK. Yeah, but Jim? I think a couple of things I would say to address that. One, I'd, I'd like the staff to try to work on something that's outside of the budget process. I think often uh, during the budget process, the focus is so much on how much money do we get for what, that often these things like units of appropriation and terms and conditions get pushed aside, maybe maybe in return for greater funding on something, or maybe just as that they move down the list of priorities as opposed to, you know, how much funding are we getting for the police department? How much funding are we getting for the Department of Health? Uh, so I think having a process, and I'm, I'm confident staff can come up with something. I have a great confidence in this staff. I think they've done amazing work uh, that is a separate process that would shine a light on that process that would essentially, they'd have a blank piece of paper if they did, at the end of the process if they didn't do anything. Uh, and I also think that, you know, yes, perhaps there'll be 30 new units of appropriation uh, in this budget because of the fact that this commission has talked about this so much, but and maybe that would even continue next year if we went away and didn't do anything, but I guarantee you that with a new mayor, the budget would go back to exactly the way it's been for the last 30 years. So I ask for your support, and I hope it's, I, I hope and I'm gonna push that it's more than forced talking, but I will be supporting some forced talking things as well as we go through the agenda, so. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. So, with, so this language will be further fleshed out between now and uh, when, when we're yeah. going on. And you, if you don't like the language and don't think that it works, when we meet again on the actual language, you can, we can eliminate it from the ballot proposals. Um, I am very, very concerned, but uh, I, I will vote a yes with the right to recall my vote later on. I just wanted to echo that I think this uh, is a great compromise, but it ensures for the future that any mayor and any city council be responsible to do this. So I too think it's a great solution. Okay, are we gonna, are we ready to call the question? Second? Second. Call the roll. Commissioner Albanese? Yes. Commissioner Berrios Paoli? Yes. Commissioner Camillo? Yes. Commissioner Karras? Yes. Commissioner Fayala? Yes, as previously stated. Commissioner Gavin? Yes. Commissioner Green? Yes. Commissioner Hirsch? Yes. Commissioner Nori? Yes. Commissioner Tisch? Yes, even though the author stole my cushion. What do you mean? He stole my cushion when I got up one time. Your cushion? Yes, he did. Would you like mine? No. I just, oh, him. Whenever we sat next to each other, I would find <laughs> the cushion. Commissioner Vaca? Yes. 
Commissioner Weisbrod? Yes. Chair Benjamin? Yes. Motion carries. Proposal 13, revenue estimate. Require the mayor to submit a revenue estimate by May 25th instead of June 5th, but allow the mayor to submit an updated revenue estimate after May 25th with the consent of the council. If the mayor does not provide a separate revenue estimate by May 25th, then the mayor's previous revenue estimate submitted with his or her April executive budget will control. Discussion? Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you to the staff. I, I know I sent some, some modifications to this and some of those made them here. Um, I'd specifically like to, to make an amendment to uh, the first bullet point uh, at the end. I don't think we should have, in the event there's an updated revenue estimate after May 25th, I don't think that should require the consent of the council. That inherently will make the revenue estimate political, I think a, a better way to ensure um, and safeguard against what may feel like um, a last minute change per se, uh, require that um, the administration and the mayor provide um, an explanation as to the economic or fiscal nature uh, for the updated revenue estimate. It's usually, that would basically force uh, the delivery of something that that would explain that any updated revenue estimate after May 25th was necessary for a, a very rare occasion. Is there discussion? Questions? Oh, sorry, Lisette? I would just like to echo uh, the, <coughs> the need for the amendment. Typically, revenue estimates change due to a financial or a fiscal change um, and that's a factual basis for which to submit a change and, and um, demonstrating or, or talking about why that was, I think is sufficient. Just wanna just echo my support for the amendment. Question. Jim? Uh, again, I, I mean, I think the reason that the consent of the council uh, is in there is because as Larry and Angelo testified before us who was first deputy director of OMB and also council finance director, that the revenue estimate often is negotiated when there is a consensus budget. So if the mayor and the council know they're heading towards a consensus budget, it seems to make sense to give them as much time as they both think they need. Uh, so I, I actually think that is sort of in keeping with how the budget process works. Uh, and then my concern with the economic fiscal explanation is that again, the exception, you know, if, if there's no showing that there are declining revenues or increasing revenues, and that that's why the May 25th, uh, a May 25th revenue estimate would be uh, premature, uh, a, a fiscal explanation could just be some big, company in the city has, is late in their June or their quarterly payments or something and and we're waiting for that or I mean it, there you know there could be a lot of sort of fiscal reasons that may not end up affecting revenue so I'm worried that the exception would sort of swallow the rule can I respond yes I, I, I hear you uh, Jim I think the, the the challenge is any of those things are indeed factual things that there is there there are instances where those changes could be material and i think the, the in this scenario even in the amendment the council and the mayor they're still negotiating the overall total budget but i think the emphasis that is that currently exists in the charter is that the majority of that that consent in, is is focused on the expense side of the ledger not the revenue i, I don't think an approval <coughs> over the revenue number and the expense number is, I don't think that's good for fiscal responsibility and I think it makes, it really in, enhances the political nature of the negotiations in a way that I don't think is productive. Carl? Yeah, I, I uh, Jim cited Larry and Angelo, who I have to say I think was the, on this particular issue was the most um, 
probably most credible uh, witness before us who has been on both sides of this, uh, both as the uh, uh, negotiator and representative of the council and also as deputy director of OMB. And, uh, you know, when directly asked, uh, Larry and Angelo said that if it were up to her, she would leave this exactly language in the, but in, the, in the charter exactly the way it is. And while you're right, Jim, that as with everything else, it's subject to conversations, discussions between um, the council and the mayor, and that's just the way the ebb and flow of the budget process works. I think the key to this is that ultimately the mayor has to be responsible for the revenue estimate. And I think what the proposal, at least the intent of the proposal, is to um, to take a, a step fur a, a step further in terms of giving at least uh, a, a revenue estimate earlier than the charter currently requires, but not to change the fundamental um, uh, uh, realities on the ground. And so that's why uh, once you include the consent of the council, um, you really are changing the, the the, the fundamental balance. And that's why I, I support um, Lindsay's uh, amendment, although I would frankly just leave it as uh, the mayor submits a revenue estimate by May 25th, and, um, uh, which could be amended. But, uh, but I, I, I think that, that I'm really guided by what um, Larian said, which I think has worked rather well over the last 40 years. So are you suggesting, Carl, a further amendment, or are you? I'm, I'm supporting <laughs> Lindsey Green's <laughs> amendment, okay. which I think is, is more thoughtful than anything I could propose. <laughs> um, are there any further discussions on this? Seeing none, call the question. Second. Let's call the roll on the amendment. Commissioner Albanese? Uh, pass. Commissioner Berrios Paoli? Yes. Commissioner Camillo? Yes. Commissioner Karras? No. Commissioner Fiala? Yes. Commissioner Gavin? Yes. Commissioner Green? Yes. Commissioner Hirsch? Yes. Commissioner Nori? Yes. Commissioner Tisch? Yes. Commissioner Vaca? No. Commissioner Weisbrod? Yes. Commissioner Albanese? Yes. Chair Benjamin? Um, with the caveat, um, that Merrill talked about earlier, the economic fiscal explanation. If we could just um, have a little more clarity on what that is and what it means, then my yes would stand on the amendment. Um, on the amended proposal, is there additional discussion? If not, call the question. Second. Call the roll. Commissioner Albanese? I'll pass. Commissioner Berrios Paoli? Yes. Commissioner Camillo? Yes. Commissioner Karras? Um, I'm a bit torn. Uh, you want to with, pass? Yeah, I'll pass. <laughs> Commissioner Fiala? Yes. Commissioner Gavin? Yes. Commissioner Green? Yes. Commissioner Hirsch? Yes. Commissioner Nori? Yes. Commissioner Tisch? Yes. Commissioner Vaca? Yes. Commissioner Weisbrod? Yes. Commissioner Albanese? Is my name Paul? Okay. Um, I'm sort of uh, uh, concerned uh, 
but we'll probably vote for it. Uh, I'm concerned because the revenue estimates change rapidly. Um, and and if, the, if the council decides that they don't want to grant the mayor an updated revenue estimate, it, it, could, it, could, be, it could be problematic. Uh, he needs to consent to the council, yet we know that these, these things change daily. Um, tax collections, uh, other issues pop up, the state budget uh, may be late, what have you. But um, with that, with those reservations, I'll still support it and vote yes. Commissioner Karras. I guess I don't have to be so torn anymore. Um, uh, I will vote yes with uh, Chair Benjamin's caveat, but even a little bit on steroids, that we really have to work to make that uh, financial reason meaningful and not just any financial reason. Chair Benjamin. I'd like to be, have my comments uh, associated with those of Commissioner Karras, who has worked long and hard on these issues. Um, and as I stated before, that the defining of this economic fiscal explanation needs to, to be less vague. Motion carries. Proposal 14, budget modification timing. Require that periodic financial plan updates be accompanied by any proposed budget modifications necessitated by such update, provided that such modifications may be filed with the council within 30 days after the relevant plan update is provided to the council. Any discussion? Call the question. Second. Call the roll. Commissioner Albanese? Yes. Commissioner Barrios Paoli? Yes. Commissioner Camillo? Yes. Commissioner Karras? Yes. Commissioner Fiala? Yes. Commissioner Gavin? Yes. Commissioner Green? Yes. Commissioner Hirsch? Yes. Commissioner Nori? Yes. Commissioner Tisch? Yes. Commissioner Vaca? Yes. Commissioner Weisbrot on the budget modification question? Uh, excuse me? On the budget, <laughs> I just saw you walking in. It's on the budget modification. Number 14. Number 14 proposal. as Correct. unchanged. Correct. Correct. Yes. Chair Benjamin? Yes. Motion carries. Proposal number 15, the rainy day fund. Make the necessary charter changes to allow the city to create and use a rainy day fund, provided that such changes will have no practical effect until either the State Financial Emergency Act expires or is repealed or amended. Discussion? Yeah. Steve? I submitted to all of you a four-page memo on this. I've spoken to most of you individually. Um, I am so pleased that this issue is finally getting the light of day. Um, I, in my memo to you, I talked about this being a very unique opportunity to finally address this issue. We've talked about it for years. The impediments, while not insubstantial, were not insurmountable, but we chose not to do that in the past. I said that we also had an opportunity to address the issue relating to the Retiree Health Benefits Trust Fund, which is a good idea when it was conceived. It's a good idea now. However, I do believe the time was ripe for us to codify that into the charter, first of all, and to put the appropriate strings to it so as to ensure that that liability, which now is about $105 billion, is dealt with with that program as opposed to that, uh, that particular fund being used as a rainy day fund de facto. I'm not going to push an amendment to deal with that because I realize that uh, you can only get so much. And we've really 
Madam Chair, I want to thank you because I think you know this was my number one priority. And uh, in the past, we've just, we punted, punted, punted. I want you all to know this. If there was nothing else that we did, nothing else that we did, this is the most important thing we will have done. And it isn't about numbers. I often hear you're concerned about the budget, you're the numbers, numbers, numbers. I hate numbers, I'm terrible at math. This is really about the poorest of the poor and the middle class because they are the ones who have, from the time we started having recessions until now, they're the ones that always suffer. It's the service cuts that hit them the most, <coughs> it's their social safety nets that's eviscerated, and it's taxes that are imposed on them. This isn't about cold numbers. This is about responsible, and I use the term, ethical fiscal stewardship. That's what's missing in this country. And quite frankly, despite good efforts, and I want to applaud Speaker Johnson, I want to applaud the mayor for the, 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 you know, the monies they set aside through the normal mechanisms, but that is not an answer. These surplus roles and the uh, other mechanisms we've used, they work fine when things are fine. And then when things aren't fine, they work fine for about an hour and a half, and then the ax falls. So what you do today, if you vote affirmatively for this, is you vote to protect the poorest of the poor and the middle class who will suffer the most during economic downturns. So I really thank you for indulging this issue. I wanna, I wanna commend uh, the Citizens Budget Commission. I've, I've sent you their report, I've talked about it. Um, I wish we could have done more, but this is a very, very significant first step, and then it would be off to Albany to deal with the, uh, the necessary legislation there. The only thing I would ask is that in the final language, a rainy day fund as a concept is great, but it's <coughs> got to be tied to something significant, right? We've got to bind the size, the scope, the inputs, and the withdrawals. Otherwise, the rainy day fund doesn't work, and staff has that material, so I won't belabor the point. But I thank you all. I think we have a chance to do something really, really extraordinary and create the type of eth ethical fiscal stewardship that is sorely lacking in the world today. So I urge your yes vote. Jimmy and then Jim. I just need clarity because um, when you talk about the rainy day fund, which I'm in favor of as well, but it says that um, such changes will have no practical effect until the State Financial Emergency Act expires or is repealed, amended. Yes. So that means that we will not have a rainy day fund until the State Financial Emergency. Now, uh, the we State will. Emergency Act, is, is that the, the old Financial Control Board from the Yes. Yeah. So we're saying that that rainy day fund will have no practical impact until that act expires? I, I don't, I need clarity. Or until it is amended. Or is repealed or amended. Correct. This, but that may, never, that? that may never happen. Yeah. The, the, the powers that be may leave that state emergency control board in, in effect for so many years. I thought we were planning a rainy day fund in the immediate future. How does it pertain, how does one relate to the other? So in a, in a previous commission I talked about the most egregious example I can give is after the 2000 downturn and the subsequent 9-11 attack on this country, this city took a massive hit. And the city council and the then mayor, in my view, did something that was uh, uh, unconscionable. We were four fiscal years away from paying off the MAC bonds, 30 years from the 75 crisis. In order to save $500 million in one fiscal year, Think of it as a home mortgage. Because we were so strapped for cash then, the city council and the mayor had no choice in their view, but essentially they went to Albany and they said, would you take this off our hands, refinance this over another 30 years? So those, those original 75 bonds were essentially renegotiated and they don't get paid off until 2033. So as a result of that, we're going to deal with a longer runway in implementing this. But this, Commissioner Vaca, is a necessary first step. This gives the push for the Speaker and the Mayor and the Council to go to Albany and say, deal with this amendment. We know how to manage our budget. We have the best budgetary system in America, and we do. 
What we do today will strengthen it during those, during those downturns. This is just the missing link, I think, that is, has been missing all along. And it really addresses uh, those rocky waters. I think the C uh, Citizens uh, Budget Commission talked about weathering the storm. That's what it does. It weathers the storm for the poorest of the poor and for uh, the middle class. I wish we could get it. I've wrestled with this for uh, 22 years. Um, I was told, no, 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 no. What this is is the moral authority for the city to go up to Albany and say, we have done our part and the people of New York have spoken and said there shall be a rainy day fund. So now let's begin to amend all of the Financial Emergency Act statutes that are impediments to doing this. We can shorten the term uh, from 2030 backwards, but at the worst case scenario, it would be at the expiration. I'm willing, uh, since, since, since it's been 22 years waiting, Another decade is not what I want, but not having this means we continue to have the poorest of the poor and the middle class suffer perennially, downturn after downturn after downturn. But I share your frustration. Okay. I am supportive of, completely supportive of the concept of a rainy day fund. I do have one area that I think I differ from Steve on, and that's I have a concern that we not mandate when money has to be put into the fund. I think that needs to be a negotiation between the council and the mayor in the budget process, and I think all the OM that's probably the only thing I agreed with all the OMB people who appeared before us uh, who, that said, you know, that we should not be uh, saying when, how much money has to be put in, because there could be times when, you know, that money may have to be taken from, from other essential services. So I think in the case of the role, that's always negotiated. In the case of the employee, uh, um, the retiree health benefits trust fund, that's always negotiated. I, I think I would be able to wholeheartedly support a plan where the inputs are negotiated but the outputs, the withdrawals, can only be made in times of decreasing revenues or uh, unexpected uh, significant expenses, something to that effect. Uh, well, Jim, I, I operate under this philosophy. The, the, what is it? The good can't be the enemy of the perfect. Um, I have great concerns if you don't have a tight structure but I have greater concerns if we don't have any structure at all, right? This battle has been too long um, for it to go down for that. There is, I, 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 would, I would urge though that the commission provide as some supporting material. You know, when legislation is passed, years later, something's in court and the litigators all say, go, go get the memorandums of understanding and see what their intent was back then, right? Let's see what the original intent was. I would love it if in that documentation we gave an expression that we do believe that the, uh, the CFOA, which is the, the national organization that sets these parameters, um, is the right mechanism, and we strongly advise and urge uh, compliance with that. But I do understand your concern, and I'll be damned if I'm gonna let this go down because I want everything. So, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly prepared. I can to work move with forward. that. Okay. And Any, I thank you. Any further discussion? Would somebody describe for me what I, um, is, is there a change in this no, proposal no, 15? No. no changes? No, okay. No discussion. <laughs> then call the question. Second. Call the roll. Commissioner Albanese. Uh, before I vote, I'd like to commend uh, Commissioner Fiala on his passionate advocacy for this. Uh, I, I, I support a rainy day fund, and uh, 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 Commissioner Fiala has certainly um, made very compelling points on, on how important it is. I mean, we all talk about it, and, and I say it's a great thing, but um, when, when, uh, when Commissioner Fiala 
drills down on it, you realize how important it is. So I want to commend him for his advocacy and, and vote yes on the uh, proposal. Commissioner Berrios Paoli? Yes. Commissioner Camillo? Yes. Commissioner Karras? Uh, yes, with the caveat that uh, there be, uh, that, that we don't do anything that would require uh, putting in certain amounts at certain times. Commissioner Fayala? With the happiest yes I can give. Commissioner <laughs> Gavin? Yes. Commissioner Green? Yes. Commissioner Hirsch? Yes. Commissioner Nori? Yes. Commissioner Tisch? Yes. Commissioner Vaca? I want to thank Commissioner Fayello for his work on this, and the total effort he put into this was amazing, but uh, he believes in this, and he took it to task, and I commend him, and I think it's something long overdue. I vote yes. Commissioner Weisbrod? I also vote yes, and also commend Commissioner Fiala for his passion on this issue, and for his focus on it, and also the Citizens Budget Commission, which testified before us on the importance of this, and um, I uh, happily vote yes. Chair Benjamin? Yes. Motion carries. Proposal 16, guaranteed budgets for the public advocate and borough president require that the personnel budgets for the public advocate and borough presidents be set at or above their respective fiscal year 2019 personnel budgets adjusted for inflation, provide for a mechanism in which the mayor can propose and the council may adopt a lower budget in cases where the mayor has established there is a fiscal necessity for doing so. In fiscal year 2019, the personnel budget for the public advocate was 3.3 million. For the borough presidents were 4.8 million in the Bronx, 5.2 million in Brooklyn, 4.2 million in Manhattan, 4.0 million in Queens, and 3.6 million in Staten Island. Discussion. Jimmy? Just a, a point of clarification. So we're setting the budgets where they are in FY 2019, but then they will be automatically adjusted for inflation every year? Well, there is a a possible amendment um, to establish 2020 as the baseline year instead of 2019. But yes, then there, whatever the baseline year is, they would be adjusted, adjusted for inflation thereafter. So that would not require council action and the mayor would be compelled to include the inflationary increase in his budget. And then if there was money up and above that for the public advocate or the borough presidents, that would be at the discretion of the mayor and the council. Correct. Okay. Um, Meryl? You know, th this reminds me of a conversation we had an hour and a half ago. And I will want to remind us that we promised ourselves not to repeat the conversation, but I would just also like to say there needs to be a mechanism in which the executive in charge has the ability to make a decision should there be a fiscal crisis. Mm -hmm. Not to punish, but should there be. And so I intend to vote yes with that caveat. I agree with that caveat. Um, I was just going to offer an amendment, which has been um, suggested by a number of the offices that are contained herein, that since by the time this is adopted, it will be fiscal year 2020, that we use fiscal year 2020 as the baseline budget. But I'm concerned about having it automatically uh, increased on the inflation rate. So that was an amendment that was put forward right. to not adjust these baselines, whether at 19 or 20. Okay, but we have one amendment on the floor now. Can we just vote on that amendment and then we'll take other amendments as, and then we'll go back to the main item. Discussion on the, using 2020 as the base instead of 2019 since we'll be in FY 2020 then. Call the question. Second. Call the roll. Commissioner Albanese? Uh, yes. Commissioner Berrios-Paoli? Yes. 
Commissioner Camillo? Yes. Commissioner Karras? Yes. Commissioner Fayala? Yes. Commissioner Gavin? No, because of the adjusted for inflation. We're only voting on the amendment. Okay. Okay. Commissioner Green? I, I second Paula's question. Yes to 2020 instead of 19, but uh, not on the language regarding inflation. Okay. So that's a yes on the motion to change it to 2020. And the yes, narrowly yeah. that motion, yes. Commissioner Hirsch? Yes. Commissioner Nori? Yes. Commissioner Tisch? Yes. Commissioner Vaca? Yes. Commissioner Weisbrod? Yes. Chair Benjamin? Yes. The motion carries. I understand there are some, um, but Paula, you, I would assume, want to offer the amendment or someone that um, that the budgets not be automatically adjusted for inflation, removing that language, is that correct? correct. Yes. Excuse me, correct. Yes. Um, is there discussion? I would just like to add that, you know, there are times when inflation is, is not, it's in, there are times you may need to adjust the budget that are independent of inflation that applies to the entire budget. Um, we naturally react to that and the council and the mayor negotiate that. I don't think anything should be automatically indexed to inflation in the budget. Allison? So my concern without having any kind of indexing or method for adjustment is that, you know, in a very short number of years, the baseline budget will start, will be going down, right, as opposed to up in, in all practicality. Is there another method of indexing that you would feel more comfortable with The you know, often minimum wage increases, for instance, are tied to the consumer price index instead of to inflation? Is there um, something, because it, uh, strikes me as concerning to set a baseline budget at a time when we know that over time uh, an exact dollar figure becomes less meaningful. I, I, I hear your point. I mean, I, I think any any index might be might be problematic. I think the um, the amendment includes some language about that gives the mayor some flexibility to adjust that 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 floor so to speak if necessary um, is that not sufficient well, the, sorry, the language as I read it gives the mayor the uh, mechanism to propose a lower budget where there's a fiscal necessity but not a higher budget so I think, yes, I think the, there's an inherent idea that the budget can always go higher if the mayor and the council agree. Rather than having it being automatic. I, I guess I, I would argue that having no way to index defeats the purpose of setting a baseline budget for the offices. Okay. Carl, you were next. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate what, um, I think, I certainly agree that to simply require, and I think Allison implicitly agrees this as well, to simply require requiring an index to inflation does not, uh, it, it is not a, a appropriate really for any item in, in the budget. Um, but at the same time, a desire to, in effect, protect the relationship of, um, uh, of the elected officials' budgets to uh, relative to the city as a whole, in a sense. And I would suggest just going back to what um, Dr. Tish said earlier, this is really quite similar to the issue uh, we confronted earlier. And I, I would ask on this that the staff try to struggle and come up with language that um, protects against the uh, 
a, a, a malignant intent um, uh, on the part of the executive or the executive and council together, um, as we discussed with respect to the CCRB, um, but also recognizes that ultimately um, this is the kind of issue that in times of fiscal stress, um, uh, the body politic has to deal with. And so we have to face this issue with the CCRB, and I suggest a similar um, hard look by the staff here. So are you suggesting that we would leave in the, um, the language, cost I, I, of living, I, or whatever the... I, I don't think we should. I, I, I feel quite uncomfortable about, and I, I think we all recognize that simply indexing this to inflation is, uh, as, with, as with any policy in the budget, not as with any item in the budget, not good budget management, but we want to protect basically the, 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 the relative budgets of the other elected officials um, with other offices and so, um, and protect particularly against um, um, uh, political uh, payback, which I think is really. I think it was more than that that uh, was spoken about. I think it was also just if the budget remains frozen in the same amount, it's worth less money every year. So if you have 25 staff members and each staff member is making $10,000. Um, cost of living inflation. Well, but the city's budget as a whole could stay frozen for a year or two or three. In, we've, we've been going through a period of, um, of, um, of rising revenues in the city for the last several years, but let's not you know, let's not assume that that's going to proceed forever. Uh, it won't, and um, and to, so to, we could easily have, and we have had many times over my lifetime, um, inflation um, with a a serious reduction in in city revenue. And so, I just think we have to come up with a uh, an approach that recognizes that we don't want to see these elected offices uh, lose ground relative to the budget, but to index it to inflation, I think would be Do you a have very a different suggestion problem. than inflation? Uh, so, so no, no I, I think I, it would be very difficult to have, to, to index it at all. I think, I, I do think that there is a, 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 what we want to protect against is is um, uh, uh, an inappropriate intent on the part of either the executive or the legislative or the executive and legislative together if they're, if they're unhappy with a particular borough president or the public advocate. And, and um, I, I do believe that it's possible for the staff to come up with an approach. That's Lillian all I'm and then Allison. Yeah, I I think you know we um, it's more than that. I think we want to provide a stable budget so that they can do the job they're supposed to do. Um, and what we have seen in the last few years is that their budget is certainly not appropriate to what the job that they have to do. So, look, we pegged the CCRB to some percentage of the police department budget. We pegged IBO is pegged to some percentage of, of OMB's budget. So, shouldn't the public advocate and the borough president be pegged to some percentage of the mayor's budget, the, you know, the office of the mayor's budget? Um, and that's more objective, and that certainly is not arbitrary in any way. I, I, it, it may be an approach worth looking at. I'm just saying that the, that to, I think we all recognize what the objective is and we all recognize the risk that we're trying to avoid. And so I, I don't think that the, we're gonna come up with the exact language tonight. And again, I would ask the staff to look at it. Um, Allison and then Jimmy. Um, I just want to first associate myself with what Dr. Barris-Paoli said. I think that is worth looking at. I also think that 
Well, Commissioner Weisbrod, your point about the if the city's revenues go down and the rest of city government's budget goes down, then these offices shouldn't be um, exempt from that and see inflation. I think that is a valid point. So I would say that having the it we just cannot be I do not we cannot be in a situation where the rest of the city budget is going up and these offices are by default going down. Okay. Jimmy and then Steve. These officer these offices are there for a reason. These offices represent entities that are independent of the mayor and these offices are asking for an inflationary increase. I think the rate of inflation last year was 2%. So maybe in the Bronx, we would get $150,000 more for the borough president's office. Even in times of fiscal crisis, this is, this, this is peanuts, peanuts. Why don't, we look at, why don't we look at the expansion of the mayor's office in the past 15, 20 years? How many more employees? You think it would be nice to limit the mayor to 1% or 2%? Of course not. We're limiting these people to one or two percent to recognize that they're independent entities. We are already a city where the mayor is all powerful. Our form of government is the mayor form of government. The mayor is the most powerful person. So if we have the public advocate and the borough presidents, I think mandating an inflationary increase, look at the numbers of their budgets. Two percent, three percent to Staten Island, 3.6 million, peanuts. And we're arguing over this. I don't know, do we want any check on the mayor? Or maybe we just don't, maybe we want a more powerful mayor, but we in this commission are retaining these offices. We've decided to retain them. We'll give them a little bit of not having to go hand and cup in hand every year to the mayor and the council for, 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 for bones. They should not have to do that. They should have a budget that's guaranteed because if they don't have a budget that's guaranteed with a small inflationary increase, yes, if they don't have that, they have to come to the entities that they are independent of for the money. That's the whole point. And that point was made by Tish James for years. That point was, is being made by Jemani now and by the borough president, and they're right. Steve? Thank you. Um, the, this is exactly what we've been dealing with for 30 years, right? This is why the original commission and the eight subsequent commissions, Dr. Barry Paoli and I served together on the 2004-05 commission. We took it up, it was taken up in every commission. What we have is the distance of time now, 30 years removed, right? To your point, Council Member Vaca, um, uh, Dean Lane, Doug Muzio and a host of others who were there said that they didn't do enough, that this was an office that they really needed, uh, they needed for political reasons um, and for legitimate perspective reasons. There are three levels of governance, local, borough, and citywide. And the borough presidents got a lot taken away and got very little given. And what they were given was insufficient. Now, with respect to budgets, I share Commissioner Weisbrod's concerns. I always have. I think what you're saying is we want to find a way to insulate these uh, actors, these political actors, from um, uh, cuts that are not related to anything other than economic downturn cuts, right? Well, insulate, I, I would say them. we want to insulate them from essentially politically motivated cuts. Politically motivated. I think Commissioner Barrios Paoli, who probably has more experience than anybody uh, in government, um, been there and done everything. Your proposal actually is, in my mind's eye, the logical middle ground. Okay? And it seems to be the logical direction that we're moving in. As we get into this experiment, 30 years removed, we've had the argument with, with, with the CCRB, with COI, with all of these agencies. IBO has always been the model that everybody uses. It's pegged, it's pegged, it's pegged. If they set the precedent then, well, why can't we do it now? So if there's no objection, I, I think what you're saying is that uh, you'd like us to 
amend the proposal to find some kind of a formula tied to the office of the mayor um, that will solve the issue of um, the erosion of funding because of, of um, uh, the mayor not granting, right? When a, a rising tide lifts all boats, right? When the mayor's budget goes up then, which indicates good economic times, I think that's your point, Lillian, right? It, then everybody's budget should go up, right? But that there exists a mechanism still that under extraordinary circumstances, to Dr. Tish's point, there, there is a need to have some kind of a, a way to cut. I think that's the fairest mechanism that anybody could concede, uh, could conceive of. And uh, I don't know if, if the, I don't mean to say you have an amendment on the floor, uh, but I think trying to bridge all of the concerns, uh, we, we need to do something to your right. point. Can, we need to do something about this. Can, can, I, can I just respond I'm to, done. to uh, Steve? I, I, I do agree we need to do something, and I understand what uh, Lilliam is saying. I think, it, uh, unlike, un, unlike the uh, comparing uh, the, uh, or pegging IBO to OMB, where their functions are very similar, or even the CCRB, the mayor's office, as Lilliam, who has been there many times, can attest, is an ever-changing uh, entity. A lot of things are in the mayor's budget. A lot of things leave the mayor's budget, go out and go into various agencies. So I'm not convinced that that is the right thing to peg it to. I do agree. I, I think, again, as we discussed with the CCRB, I do think that we do want to protect these elected offices from from politically malevolent uh, budget cuts. I mean, I think that's the goal. And so I, again, ask staff to try to come up with an approach, table this for now, and, and I think we all, I think we all have the same goal and the same fears. And so uh, I, I, we should be able we should be, a, this, is, this is more a matter of a mechanism than a principle, and so I, I would hope that we could come up with a way to do it. Steve, would you like to state what it is we're asking staff to do? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, Thank you, Steve. I, I, think, I think Commissioner Weisbrot is, no, no. Is, is, okay. um, uh, I, I, I think we are, everyone is welcome to, jump in and say that I've totally misunderstood. Um, for proposal number 16, we would like staff to come back with language that would require some manner of assuring the personnel budgets of the public advocate and public and borough presidents um, that would have the year 2020 as its baseline budget, but would allow for a way for the budgets to be flexible and tied to something, whether the mayor's office or some other objective criteria um, when it came to how the budget would increase. Um, I think, Carl, though, I would add to what you said that there, there's not just the concern about the malevolent mayor or the malevolent council, both of which could and have been true, but is also just the concern that each year if we don't, if the budget doesn't have an automatic way to increase, each year that particular amount of money buys less and less, uh, which is the starvation possibility for the... I so think I we think appreciate that. I think it's both that. issues, right. not just... I appreciate just, that. Okay. And that's, and that's right. That's um, 
Um, so I made the motion to remove the inflation indexing, so I would amend that emo motion to remove the inflation indexing but create a ratio to protect the offices. How does that sound? I would make a motion to re, um, remove the inflation indexing but create a ratio to protect these offices. Can I just, for clarification, I thought that we were discussing similar to what we did with the previous proposal to table the, to table a vote on this proposal while the staff look into and prepare uh, or clarify language. Yes, but Paula is suggesting another way to go. So in a way, I thought we had actually in the CCRB, we approved it based on the, the conceptual agreement, but with an, or in a decision to rewrite it. So in a way, I was thinking it was very similar, but it was taking out the inflation indexing, which is currently in the motion. Well, I think um, I'm willing to go either way. I mean, if we want to just send it back for rewrite, but I was trying to get the conceptual agreement approved. I'm just not sure. You have to change fiscal year 19 to 20. Right, we did that. We adopted that so amendment. That so we that motion. And then she wants to take out adjusted for inflation. If I can make a motion to table this item, um, I think that's the best approach. I, I believe that the inflation 1%, 2% is a floor. So, but I do understand that there's a hesitation about how we insulate these offices and protect them. So I would make a motion to table at this time. Um, just a point of clarification. Does it uh, table the entire discussion without any direction to staff? A table with direction to staff to come back with a uh, report based on our concerns about insulating these offices and protecting them protecting them going forth and giving them adequate budgets. So point of order, man. So the, I have, I, I'm still stuck on Commissioner Green's amendment from like 20 minutes ago. And, <laughs> and now I think Commissioner it was Gavin's and, and, and <laughs> <coughs> you shouldn't have given us that charge earlier. Okay. <coughs> Can um, I have a, thank you. Um, I would like to suggest as follows, that except for the 2020 amendment and using that as the baseline, that all the amendments be withdrawn and that what we adopt is a direction for staff that using the year 2020 as a baseline, um, they come back with a mechanism um, for the orderly conduct of budgeting for the public advocate and borough presidents um, and with, as Merrill has said, with a response to the mayor having the ability in a fiscal downturn or however we're expressing this and to not use that method or to lower the budgets, basically. I'm sorry that's if that's not clear, bullet. but. Chair, that's already in the second bullet. <coughs> Provide for a mechanism in which the mayor can propose. <coughs> right. Yeah. So with that, which may not be as clear as I have been earlier in the evening, um, is there discussion or can we, by uni unanimous consent, direct staff to do that and to come back to us? I move to do that. Motion to. Second. By unanimous consent, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, so staff is, understands their direction. <laughs> um, there was one more amendment on this. I think. Uh, um, okay. Um, <clears throat> proposal number 17. Euler pre-certification notice period 
For projects sub subject to ULERP, require that a project summary sufficient in detail so as to put the affected community on notice of impending land use action entering public review be transmitted to the affected borough presidents and community boards and borough board, I guess, if required, and be published online before such application is certified as complete by the Department of City Planning. The, su the summary must be published, transmitted, no later than 30 days before the application is certified, and the certified application must be consistent with the project summary that is published and transmitted. Discussion? Jim? I'm concerned that this doesn't really do anything. Uh, it requires a notice that pretty much any uh, borough president's office or community board can get by asking the Department of City Planning for a you know, list of pre-applications. Uh, I, as originally conceived, this was supposed to be a 60-day period uh, and require, uh, allow co for comments uh, by the borough president and community boards uh, and require response to those comments. And I would like to see that uh, put back. I know uh, Steve talked about, you know, forced talking. Uh, I, I'm worried that the way this has evolved, it's not, it's forced dropping a piece of paper in the mail that with information that you could get without the piece of paper. So, so it really isn't even, it doesn't even reach the level of forced talking. So uh, I, I would ask uh, commissioners to please consider putting some, some meat on this. Discussion? I mean, I'm going to take the prerogative and then Jim and then Carl and then anybody else. Uh, we have had the discussion, I know, and <clears throat> my understanding was what was being requested was notification. We do have a ULERP process, and during that process, as imperfect as it may be, all of the people you're talking about have time periods for comment. Um, I am concerned about the idea of establishing a pre-ULERP ULERP comment period, and I'm concerned that that takes away from the process that we have. I think ULERP, there are places and ways in which ULERP could use some fresh air on all sides. Um, we, we all know that community boards are not all equal. They don't all use their time periods well. But to establish a pre-ULERP ULERP just seems to me to avoid the question of what's wrong with ULERP. Um, you were next, Jimmy. Um, I tend to agree with both the chair and Commissioner Karras. I think both of you have put together concisely the problems with this recommendation. Um, to have the community boards go online and make suggestions in a 60-day period or ask questions, I mean, that kind of reminds me right now of, of the um, community boards making capital budget recommendations. Have any of you ever seen community boards make recommendations on the capital budget? And for years, back to when I was a district manager, the response from every agency says, no money for this, no money for that. They don't, they don't give a response. They don't give a detailed answer. They just say it's not in our plans. Well, of course it's not in your plans. The community board's asking for it knowing it's not in your plan. That's what community boards get. So I know that we're concerned about community engagement. At least we say we want more community engagement, and the voters voted for a community engagement panel in the last referendum in November on charter revisions. I've suggested that at the interagency level, when the City Planning Commission convenes meetings with city agencies, interagency meetings are convened for a year or two, 
before an item is ULERPed and certified. At those meetings, there should be the community board district manager and a representative of the borough president's office. They are city agencies. So how can the Department of City Planning have pre ulerp scoping and design meetings and meet with applicants about development projects and the community board and the borough president, who are city agencies, are not there while DOT is there, while Parks is there, while DDC is there, and all the other agencies? That's where that involvement makes sense. This is all much to do about nothing. What I see in front of me is more of the gobbledygook, basically. Let's get down to brass tacks, and that's what community boards are entitled to. We don't treat community boards as full city agencies, and they are, and then when they object to a project, we say, oh, you're all a bunch of NIMBYs. Sure, we brought you in after we determined what we were gonna do. What do you think the community boards are going to feel like? But, and by the way, I have to say something. Uh, Madam Chair, and I will end here. Um, when I first became a community board member in 1977, they were called community planning boards in the old charter before they were brought on as community boards. They were planning boards. They should be part of the planning process, and we have to engage them and bring them in. So I would make a suggestion that we do so and that we specify this in the charter. Thank you. Carl? Well, I will simply um, I will simply associate myself with the comments of the chair because I think that um, the purpose of this proposal was, as the chair said, to provide notice. Now, the reality is that in most cases, certainly when it's a city application and when it's a large application. Um, and when uh, a, a private applicant is seeking something, in most cases, and in every case when it comes to a city application, there is extensive discussion with the community well before certification. The purpose of this was to assure that in those cases where that, for one reason or another, hasn't taken place, that the community board and the borough president have some advance notice before EULA formally starts. But to amend this to require a longer notice, um, 60 days, during which time, for some reason or other, maybe the application changes. Um, um, by having it as 30 days notice, it's reasonably fresh um, uh, but still giving advance notice to the community board and to the borough president. And then to require on top of that responses back and forth is, as the chair is saying, creating a pre ulip ulip and extending ULIP from seven months to who knows how long. So I support the proposal as it stands and I oppose the amendment. Anyone else? Call the question on the amendment, which is to extend the period to 60 days and require applicant responses to come in submitted during such period. Call the question. Second. Call the roll. Commissioner Albanese? Oh, pass. Commissioner Berrios Paoli? Yes. Commissioner Camillo? No. Commissioner Karras? Yes. Commissioner Fayala? No. Commissioner Gavin? No. Commissioner Green? No. Commissioner Hirsch? Pass. Commissioner Nori? Yes. Commissioner Tisch? No. Commissioner Vaca? I vote no because this does not address the issue of community engagement and community board meaningful participation. No. Commissioner Weisbrod? No. Commissioner Albanese? Yes. Commissioner Hirsch? Yes. Chair Benjamin? No.
Five votes in the affirmative, eight votes in the negative. The motion fails. Can I make a motion? Sure. I, can I, Madam Chair, can I? Tell what? me what the motion is. On, is the motion an amendment to? I'll make an amendment to whatever you said. Proposal, seven, proposal yes. 17? Amendment to 17. Since 17 has failed, I make an amendment. No, 17 didn't fail. Only the amendment to 17 failed. The amendment to 17. Oh, so now, all right, 17. I'll make an amendment to 17 saying that um, community boards and borough presidents' offices um, must be involved in interagency pre-certification meetings on ULERP items held by the City Planning Commission. I think, Jimmy, that that would be in the category B or C. It was not on the original it, it's been. List. I, I've suggested it several times. It was on my emails. I can look them up. I, I understand, but th those things that were not in the original staff list are all in B and C. So what well, I don't see, I, I don't see my suggestion on this topic in B or C, Madam Chair. And I have emails where I did make the suggestion, and I've made it publicly, publicly at previous public hearings we've had. And I don't see it anywhere. So I make well, it as an amendment would, now. But I, I know I publicly have stated it, and I have emails. I will certainly allow you to bring it up on B and C when we do those, um, but not as an amendment to 17. Um, but I think, Madam Chair, if I can urge your indulgence, I think it's, an, it's germane to number 17 because we're talking about community board notice. But it's, it's germane. I don't think it's the notice that you're talking about. We're talking about community board, a particular project statement and project summary that is to be provided 30 days before certification. You're talking about meetings that may occur at some time prior to that point. Um, so I don't think that they are the same issue. As I said, I think that as a matter of C, we can take this up at the next meeting and you can propose it, but I don't think it's an amendment in the same area as, as Proposal okay. 17. I, I accept your ruling. Okay. Um, can I, I, I believe that we were voting not on the amendment, but on the actual um, Motion 17, so I want to clarify. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I would have voted no to the amendment. Okay. So, Commissioner, is <laughs> Lillian is changing her vote because she thought it was on the whole. The revised vote total is four in the affirmative, nine in the negative. Okay, so proposal 17, as is. Discussion. Call the question. Call the roll, please. Second. <laughs> Commissioner Albanese? A pass. Commissioner Berrios Paoli? Yes. Commissioner Camillo? Yes. Commissioner Karras? Yes. Commissioner Fiala? Yes. Commissioner Gavin? Yes. Commissioner Green? Yes. Commissioner Hirsch? Yes. Commissioner Nori? Yes. Commissioner Tisch? Yes. Commissioner Vaca? Commissioner Weisbrod? Yes. Commissioner Albanese? Yes. Chair Benjamin? Yes. Motion passes. Proposal 18 is for an additional ULERP review time for community boards. Uh, as many of you know, the community boards have long asked for additional time in the summer months when they don't meet regularly or at times at all. This proposal would provide that community boards have 90 days instead of 60 days to review ULERP applications that are certified by city planning in June and 75 days to review ULERP applications certified by DCP between July 1st and July 15th inclusive. Discussion? Call the question. Unanimous, can we call the question by unanimous consent? Yes. I think so. Yeah. Second? Yes. Call the question by unanimous consent. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 
And with that, we end our Part A. Um, I would ask the commissioners at this point, um, we have Part B and C, which we will not do in this way. My intention is that if there are items on Part B and C or elsewhere, as Commissioner Vaca raised, that commissioners wish to bring back to the floor to try and add to A, we will do those items and only those items. Um, it is 20 to 10. I don't know if people would like to stay and attempt to do it or if they would like to come back on the 18th. Can I get a show of hands for how many people would like to come back on the 18th? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah. yeah. Do we have to come back anyway? No. no. Well, we have those. We have those two items that we are directing staff to come back with, um, with a fully fleshed out. Madam Chair. So wait. So I was looking at B and C during the evening when some of the conversation was going up, going on. And one of the things that struck me about items of C was in the context of the conversation that we had tonight, some of those items become clear, some become a little more murky. And I think that, for one, I want to go back, I want to see the next write-up that staff does, right? When does that, because I know you guys have been doing nothing for weeks, when do we get the next edits? Um, or language, or do, well, well, I withdraw the question. Let me put it differently, dear. When we get the next edits, I think that B and C will get some more clarity to them, right? Well, we're going to get the edits for the two items that we asked staff to go back and rework. Right. And I would anticipate we will have those on the 18th. Mm -hmm. And what about specific language um, for the for some of these the ballot the, the language that would be used for the ballot, et cetera, will be forthcoming for our July meeting. July. Okay. 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 So I'll do what everyone else wants to do, but I'm exhausted. Al, uh, Sal, not Al. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm older than you. Sal or Al? I mean. I just lost a letter. Uh. I, I uh, uh, would uh, uh, recommend that we come back on the 18th for the rest of the items. I mean, I, I've got an, a number of items that are pretty exhaustive. I mean, I've got an exhaustive presentation, at Do least you, one or two of them. You're going to exhaust us, or your presentation Possibly. is yeah, well, that's, so that's complete? That's my objective. That that's my objective. Uh, so I, I, I think it's, we've been here for almost three and a half, almost four hours. I. I you know, I, I would appreciate it if we could come back and deal with those items then. Paula? Uh, my only question is on Part B, those are ones that, are there any that we can eliminate tonight from Part B, or any that we should choose from Part B, or should we come back and look at all of those in Part B? Um, I, I don't think there's any way. Is there anyone who intends to pull something out of Part B to try and put it on Part A at this moment in time? Yes. Okay, so we can't eliminate Part B. I mean, we can try, I can try sure. to they are, but I don't know what other commissioners might, or commissioners that aren't here. Paula had asked the question as to whether we could just excise Part B because no one had issues that they wish to discuss in Part B. But we do have people who have issues in Part B that they would like to discuss and move to Part A, so we can't do as Paula asked. You don't have to explain what the issues are now. It's enough to know that we cannot merely eliminate from further consideration Part B. Can, can, Madam Chair, can I make a suggestion? that you may. As long as it's a good one. <laughs> I, <laughs> I may withdraw it, but uh, um, that, that if there are items in uh, Part B or C that people would like to discuss, that they send them to us in advance so we can think about them. I mean, so 
at least is, we can. Is that a motion, Carl? I'll, I'll, I'll make it as a motion that if we don't get literally these items in the next couple of days, we can assume that anything else on B and C will not be discussed and be eliminated. And just we can just focus on those hopefully few items that people feel are very important. I heard a... Well, uh, again, I want to say that my item is not here even. So what do I do with my item that's not here? Put it okay, in Okay, I am, I am told by council that um, what you're proposing would run afoul of open meetings law. Um, okay, sorry. Can we amend the open meetings law? No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Just teasing, just teasing, just teasing. Okay, I, I misspoke. I'm told it's, we should, it is cleaner for us to adjourn without promise, making any promises about the rest of this list. I would suggest as a courtesy, however, that if people have intentions of bringing things up from Part B or Part C and trying to get them on to Part A, that they let us know so that we can all think about it. Um, Madam Chair, should we send it to staff or circulate it ourselves to the members? It's always nice if you send it to staff and then staff can circulate okay, it. Okay, great. But if you'd like to do it no, yourself, no, no. feel free. No, no. Uh, whatever is, works best for. I think staff is too young to be up writing <laughs> in the middle of the night. <laughs> I get your emails in the middle of the night. <laughs> Pathetic, guys. Pathetic. <laughs> well, what are you doing up in the middle? Okay, I would like to. <laughs> I would like to thank everybody for their participation and particularly those of you who have stuck it out with us as we have debated and talked and clashed and uh, come together on these issues. Um, I believe that the sense of the group is that we are going to adjourn this meeting and that we will reconvene on the 18th at 6 o'clock in this room. I make a motion to adjourn, Madam Chair. Second. Everybody seconds for him. <laughs> I have to drag it out of you. <laughs> I became a second. What? Call the roll. Thank you, Jill. All in favor? No, all in favor. Yes. Do you, uh, Boys vote. All aye. in favor? Aye. aye. All opposed? Meeting adjourned. Certainly can. Thank you, Joe. This has lasted through a year. Can you imagine? <laughs>